everyone. I believe we are live this morning with the UNCTAD Civil Society Forum leading up to UNCTAD 15 coming in just uh, two short weeks. Welcome to the Civil Society Forums day two. This will be session four, the second plenary on trade, technology and development, reframing the discourse. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, let me start by expressing my sincere thanks to all of our colleagues at the Caribbean Policy Development Center, CPDC, for their tireless work to bring this all together. I welcome to all of you here, in particular to distinguished ambassadors and delegates from UNCTAD member states, as well as civil society representatives and others from around the world. Thank you all so much. Congratulations on making it through what was a challenging registration system of UNCTAD. And I hope we are all able to attend who were, uh, who were wanting to be here today. My name is Deborah James, and I'm the Director of International Programs at the Center for Economic and Policy Research. Uh, and it is a pleasure uh, for me to also facilitate the global Our World is Not for Sale network of public interest organizations, development advocates, environmental groups, trade unions, and others in the global south and the global north fighting the current model of corporate globalization embodied in the global trading system, particularly with the current WTO. Our World is Not For Sale is committed to a sustainable, socially just, democratic, and accountable multilateral trading system. And for that reason, we have all been very involved with UNCTAD for decades, and in particular involved with helping to ensure that UNCTAD's mandate actually delivers on improving the global trade system for developing countries and not just helping countries to adjust to a system that is actually quite anti-development. So it's my honor today to moderate this panel. Um, I understand that folks can uh, submit uh, questions uh, to contribute to the debate. Uh, we will obviously have a series of speakers, but then we will um, hope to have a larger debate and you can do that by using um, the Slido. So the 15th conference of UNCTAD will occur the 3rd to 7 of October, uh, and that conference members will finalize a text which provides UNCTAD with its mandate for work for the next four years. And while much of that text has already been concluded as civil society organizations from both developed and developing countries, we believe that important gaps remain that must be remedied for the text to ensure that UNCTAD can best serve developing countries as the focal point for trade and development and the interrelated issues of finance, technology, investment, and sustainable development. So I will just make some introductory remarks about the text. As CSOs, we are in agreement that the text does not in any way measure up to the current and interconnected economic health, social, and environmental crises that developing countries are facing. And throughout the text, it's clear that Group B countries, which refers to developed countries, but primarily in this case, uh, refers to those represented by the European Union, worked stubbornly to block any recognition of their direct responsibility as developed countries and the global institutions that they dominate in creating the debt crisis, the climate emergency and environmental crisis, or in fact, the damage that their trade, investment, climate and financial policies have wrought on developing countries over the last decades. In contrast, the narrative focuses only on the alleged benefits of these systems, concluding that these benefits have not been shared evenly because some developing countries lack the capacity to achieve them. And under this false narrative, the solution is for UNCTAD to assist developing countries to adjust more, to take advantage of the benefits that trade of trade investment and digitalization. Of course, if the origin of the problems of today's world are not accurately assessed, then the solutions will not resolve these crises. So it must be noted that much of the problems that developing countries face in the current system, of course, is due to the asymmetrical and unfair and really pro-corporate rules such as those in the World Trade Organization, including through the trade-related intellectual property rules of TRIPS, the General Agreement on Tariffs and, and on Trade and Services, the GATS, the TRIMS investment-related measures, the AOA, agriculture, 
and other agreements which actually constrain countries from using trade for their development. At the same time, we do commend the G77 for their tremendous efforts to successfully ensure that various key aspects of the role of UNCTAD have been preserved thus far. So each of the panelists today will speak to different aspects of that mandate and what we as CSOs believe should have been or still should be in the context of their own specific regional experiences and of their vast constituencies that they represent. We have a very distinguished panel. Uh, the first three uh, speakers, uh, different panelists are gonna discuss, just to let you know how it's gonna go, various issues on the trade agenda, including intellectual property, special and differential treatment, structural transformation, and many related issues. Then we will have another group of three expert panelists who will speak to UNTED's mandate and also specifically on the issues, trade related issues such as digitalization, investment, climate related provisions, among others. And they will have about 10 minutes each. And then we will, um, we will have time for uh, a discussion. So I'm gonna um, uh, go ahead and um, introduce our first speaker. Um, our first speaker is uh, Susana Barria, who is, um, uh, has worked on issues related to social and economic justice for more than 15 years, working at Public Services International, which represents 30 million workers in 170 countries to promote quality public services in every part of the world. Susana, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Deborah. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and to be with all of you. Um, as uh, Deborah mentioned, I am here on behalf of Public Services International, which is a global union federation of workers in essential public services um, that brings together 700 trade unions uh, across the world. Um, as we are meeting today, um, the COVID-19 pandemic that has already claimed more than 4.7 million lives is really not yet on the wane. And after a relative slowdown in June, uh, we have seen that the uh, daily cases have picked up again and increased to more than 600 million daily cases as a, a weekly average. And the economic and livelihood impacts of this pandemic are already dramatic across the world. Um, and every day that the pandemic is prolonged really deepens this crisis um, and the um, consequences it, it has unleashed. A new variants of the virus, virus are driving the extension of this pandemic. The Delta variant has become dominant globally. Two new variants, Lambda and Mu, are being closely monitored. And we have to see that epidemiologists had warned that uneven and slow vaccination rollouts pose the risk of these new variants coming in. That, that is exactly what is happening and what has happening uh, over the last few months. And vaccination has been slow and more than slow, actually very unequal. We see that while in Europe, more than 65% of the population has been at least partially vaccinated, only 2% of people in low-income countries have received at least one dose of the vaccine. The pandemic has made visible underlying inequalities and one of its sharpest expression is the vaccine apartheid we are witnessing. And our members across the world have experienced firsthand the reality of this apartheid. In Pakistan, for instance, the community-based health workers who deliver essential services in rural areas and to economically vulnerable communities were faced with a real dilemma. They had the crucial role to roll out the polio vaccination campaign, which is a public health priority in the country. But at that time, the government did not have enough vaccines, COVID-19 vaccines, to ensure that they themselves had been vaccinated so that they, so that they could be adequately protected, protected while they were undertaking this important task. And this is not an isolated case. From Malaysia to South Africa and to Brazil, our members have lived the implications of the lack of access to vaccines and other health technologies. So this vaccine apartheid is probably the single most important issue facing the developing countries in the current crisis and one, will, one which will also shape their post-COVID recovery and development outcomes. And it's quite uh, concerning to see that the UNCTAD draft mandate 
not only fails to acknowledge and address this crucial issue and doesn't mention it, but it also fails to adequately address and mention the root causes and the solutions or possible solutions to this um, specific issue. A very important is uh, the shortage of vaccines that, for, of course, countries are, are facing. While there is potential and even effective production capacity that is lying unused across the developing world. Uh, just to give an example, Latin America has a history of vaccine production capacity. Cuba and Brazil produce more than half of the vaccine needs. In Africa, South Africa and Senegal have capacity and the WHO efforts to create an mRNA vaccine technology transfer hub really underline these um, capacity and, and, and potential capacity. Yet, these initiatives and other instances of either government or companies that are interested to undertake vaccine production for developing countries or in developing countries are severely conditioned, limited by the monopoly privileges that are provided by patents and other intellectual property claims. So it is very understandable that this issue has led to a widespread consensus across developing countries that these privileges need to be lifted. With close to 100 low and middle income countries supporting the proposal to suspend intellectual property protection for COVID technology at the World Trade Organization. And UNCTAD doesn't um, mention this in its mandate, while it should definitely call for an immediate agreement for the TRIPS waiver proposal so that the barriers to trade under the rubric of intellectual property can be removed and, and contribute to end the pandemic once and for all. And there is really a lot of evidence that intellectual property has posed barriers to accessing every health technology from diagnostics to protective equipment and of course um, to vaccines. And it is a shame to hear representatives from the rich world deny this reality. And in this context, it is even more important and um, yeah, even more important that the UNCTAN mandate address this fundamental issue and it does address it in para seven. It's helpful, but it's also insufficient. Um, we feel that the text should include a recognition of the barriers that trade rules in the form of intellectual property have played in preventing billions of people to access the vaccines, therapeutics, diagnostics, masks, personal protective equipment, and also mention the need for UNCTAD to work across its three pillars to remove these barriers and support recovery and development. I also want to highlight the role of public funding in accelerating the research that has led to the record speed development of the COVID-19 vaccine. It is years of public funding, which means taxpayers' money that went into supporting different lines of research that have enabled the breakthrough that we see today. And this is contrary to the claims that IT is the essential element of promoting innovation. We have seen that parallel tracks of research in various public institutions have came, come to create progressively the critical mass of knowledge that was needed um, for these innovation breakthroughs. The pharmaceutical companies' control of this knowledge through monopoly patent privileges is nothing else than the privatization of a collective effort to create a public good. And to get back to the mandate of um, the text of the mandate, while the Para 7 recognizes that COVID-19 immunization, um, it recognizes COVID-19 immunization as a global public good, it is the vaccine itself that needs to be recognized as a public good on which private control cannot be held and um, even more so when uh, the control is directed by the profit motive. Um, lauding the World Trade Organization, um, as we see in paragraph 77, Quinn, um, while this institution has failed to endorse the TRIPS waiver proposal, which is aimed at addressing the stumbling blocks faced by developing countries in responding to the pandemic, is a mockery of the UNCTAD mandate. The WTO has liberalization and not development at its center, calling for its extension just at the time where the failure of the free trade agenda to ensure better outcomes in developing countries is so visible is simply inappropriate. The document should remove the references to the role of liberalization, as we see in paragraph 16b and 77 Quinn, 
and the free trade agenda, such as in paragraph 11 and 82. And instead, the mandate of UNCTAD should direct it work it should direct it to work across all three pillars to assess the asymmetries and imbalances in the rules of the multilateral system, which constrain the ability of developing countries to implement policies in the public interest and for national and sustainable development. UNCTAD is un uniquely placed to promote and facilitate South-South cooperation, especially with regard to technology sharing and transfer. And we commend the G77 in ensuring that the text underlines that the important work of UNCTAD to support South-South cooperation should be strengthened. Evidence-based work in this arena is essential and needs to be expanded. Um, finally, unilateral coercive measures against countries such as Cuba, Venezuela, and several other countries have severely constrained the ability of these countries to access essential health inputs and technologies during the pandemic. And this has only added harm to injury. They have under, undoubtedly impeded the full achievement of economic and social development as, in, as is underlined in para 112.5. We welcome that the text asserts the role of UNCTAD in assessing the impacts of unilateral economic, financial, or trade measure, not in accordance with international law, we also welcome that it includes um, the effects it had on developing countries that are, not, that are not specifically targeted by these measures. Yet, we are concerned that the text fails to condemn these measures, which are illegal under international law and have already proven disastrous during the pandemic. Um, we note that Para 82 is problematic in that it conflates protectionism and such coercive measures and believe that the mention of protectionism and the implications for commercial interest um, should be removed from this paragraph. In conclusion, this pandemic has shown in too many ways that the rules of the trading system and the free market have failed us. The UNCTAD mandate, the UNCTAD mandate text ought to acknowledge the ways in which the current multilateral system constrains rather than facilitates countries' ability to protect the public interest, including in exceptional circumstances, such as the pandemic. And this system must thus be transformed. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Susanna, for that excellent, um, you really covered so many different issues with drilling down on how PSI, uh, because your members are those out in the field serving all of the communities around the world that are suffering from COVID and the absolute travesty that the WTO uh, is still the institution enforcing that vaccine apartheid. Uh, but you also covered so many issues there from a public service perspective. So thank you very much. Our next speaker is Jane Nalunga from the Southern and Eastern African Trade Informations and no Negotiations Institute, Siatini, Uganda. She is the country director for Uganda. And Siatini is a Pan-African CSO working on trade, fiscal development related issues for the realization of sustainable development and improved livelihoods in Uganda, East Africa, and the region. Jane, you have the floor. Um, thank you so much, Deborah, uh, for those, the introduction, and also for your introduction remarks. And also thanks to Susan uh, for her presentation. It was really great, and I will just build on to that. Uh, my experience is in Africa, in East Africa, in Uganda, and I will be presenting uh, based on those experiences. Um, as Susan has pointed out, we are in a COVID pandemic, and UNCTAD 15 is being held amidst this unprecedented COVID COVID pandemic, and the discussion on the table today is about how to build back better greener, to ensure that we promote equality, inclusive development, and also sustainable development so that we don't leave anyone, anyone behind. And if this is to happen, it's important that the global, the global rules are overhauled. Uh, we need to change those global rules fundamentally, and it, it shouldn't be business as usual. Uh, my presentation, I'm just going to look at briefly 
the place of Africa in the current trade technology and development discourse. Then I will look at also the efforts in place uh, to be able to address uh, these challenges. Then I will look at um, what we require, you know, uh, from our expectations uh, from ANCTAD and also from uh, multilateral institutions like uh, the WTO. As you know, Africa, and this is common knowledge, that Africa is, um, is lagging behind when it comes to trade. Uh, we contribute just even currently just 2% of the global, the global trade. And when you look at internally, our intra-continental trade is just around 17% when other continents are beyond 50, 50%. So we have challenges, again, uh, when you look at our trade, our trade is in primary commodities. Uh, we are at the bottom in most products, at the bottom of the value chains, exporting raw commodities and importing finished products. That's why when you look at Africa, most African countries, the challenges are ever increasing trade deficit. Uh, when it comes to technology, again, as you all know, there is the, the digital divide. And maybe what I need to point out is that the digital divide is not just between North and South, but it's also within countries. I see in my country, in our region, there is a digital divide uh, between the, the capitals the, um, and, and the rural areas, between the men and the women. So you, you find that the rural areas are completely off the, the, the uh, that, 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 that grid. So there is also that digital divide which needs to be addressed between the North and the South, but within also within countries. There is limited capacity of African countries to be able to link that to, to link that trade and also to link a technology. We are talking about the fourth industrial revolution, but linking that technology to trade, to ensure that you know, we, 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 we produce and that that technology is harnessed you know, for industrialization and for trade, that link is still very, very weak. So, so it's when we come to development, therefore, the aspiration of structural transformation as uh, pointed out in the, our aspiration of Agenda 2063 is still difficult to achieve. And this has been made worse by the current COVID pandemic. There are ongoing processes to address these issues. Uh, there are processes, for example, the continental free trade area, which is now the elephant in the room, but there are also other processes like the Africa mining vision, the high level pan on um, illicit financial flows. Uh, there are efforts on the continent to, uh, to, 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 to review the bilateral investment treaties we have signed, uh, the, the double taxation treaties we have signed. So there are a number of processes on the continent which are going on to address the economic challenges we are finding. However, you find that some of these processes, I will just give some few examples. For example, when you look at the investment policies, the investment policies, and this also came out in the ANCTAD mandate, it's just talking about promoting predictability in order to attract investments. And yet, if we are to ensure that we direct investment to sustainable development, it's important that our investment policies balance the rights of the investors, the rights of the people and communities, and the rights of the environment, so that there is a win-win situation. And investment policies should also promote the right of states to regulate in the public interest, and that the states can be able to direct investment uh, to national development priorities. We don't see this. We don't see this, not at the national levels, 
not even uh, in the WTO. Because in the WTO today, we see the investment facilitation agreement, it doesn't re um, address these issues. Um, when you look at the continental free trade area, the continental free trade area would be an opportunity for us to be able as Africa to position ourselves in the global in the global trade. It's also an opportunity to promote intra-Africa trade. It's an opportunity for us to rethink such key policies like trade policies, uh, the intellectual property, e-commerce, because these are also issues which are on the table uh, in the second phase of the negotiations. However, when you look at the the CFTA today, the CFTA, the CEO of change of the CFTA is such that the belief is that the more you liberalize, the more we trade within Africa and therefore we're going to reduce poverty. Yet the CFTA has touched very, very minimally on the issue of our productive, the productive capacities. We have also seen ongoing parallel processes. For example, while we are negotiating the continental free trade area, other countries and regions are negotiating with the EU uh, for a deeper EPA, Economic Partnership Agreement, deeper, deeper where it includes uh, issues around uh, investment, competition policies, government procurement. So when you look at that, you wonder what's, well, you know, what's going on. We also see other individual African countries, for example, in my region, Kenya, negotiating a, a very extensive a free trade area with UK and with the US. So these things are also affecting the region. Um, and for me, I think these are the areas where, um, where the, the uh, the ANCTA should be uh, looking at. Uh, uh, when you look at the multilateral trading system, the current rules are constraining really the capacity of developing countries to industrialize and to promote sustainable um, development, to promote food security. And as Susanna has pointed out, even access to, uh, to vaccines and, and, and medicines. Uh, when you look at um, the current multilateral trading system, despite the fact that for over two decades, developing countries have been calling for concluding the development agenda. Such issues, for example, like the special safeguard mechanisms, issues around public stock holding, issues around the cotton, you know, all these issues have fallen completely off the WTO agenda. Yet these are the issues which are at the heart of Africa's uh, development, you know. Um, the WTO today is promoting the 21st century issues, e-commerce, investment, which is okay, but the way they are framed won't help African countries. But what's amazing is that when you look at the UNCTAD draft text, this issue hasn't been raised. So our prayer in Africa is that UNCTAD should be able uh, to raise these issues. So what are we asking from UNCTAD? UNCTAD should be able to support African countries with uh, objective research, hmm? research which is evidence-based, Research which isn't sugar-coated, you know, by other institutions that when ANCTA brings out um, a research, then other people review, then, you know, put their, their own issues. We need research which can be able to help us address the issues which I have raised. We need research which can be able to, to, to link up, you know, to... to, to to link up the dots between trade, technology, investment, intellectual property, we need such research, which can be able to point out the flaws in our policies. Today, it's about liberalization. Yet, as Susan has pointed out, trade liberalization can, can't work. Neoliberalism can't work. So we need um, UNCTAD, which is true, 
to us, you know. And we need also anchored, which can be able to build our capacity, capacity built from below. And I want to uh, to just give an example. There was the GTAP, the Joint Integrated Technical Assistance Program. That program was so beautiful because it built capacity from below, from at the national level, bringing on board everybody at the, at the national level, but also looking at the regional, the regional level. So we need such capacity, we need such uh, as such research. Again, the issue of South-South cooperation, I just wanted to also uh, emphasize on it. It's good UNCTAD is doing that, but it should be strengthened further because we need to share experiences, South-South experiences. We need to be able to work, to work together. Maybe I stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jane, for those very, very thorough and excellent remarks, uh, particularly from the perspective of Africa and particularly Eastern Africa. You covered a wide range of issues and I think gave a lot of insight into um, how UNCTAD's mandate can still be moved uh, in the direction of um, advocating for a more fair and just economic system. So thank you so much for your comments there. And I have to say, I'm sorry that there's no chat function. We normally would be um, placing articles and information uh, written by the speakers uh, into that chat. Uh, but you can actually look at uh, ourworldisnotforsale.net and you will find um, articles by many of these speakers. For the first one, I would recommend really uh, just putting public services, international trips, waiver, COVID into your search engine and you will see their campaign work um, on that issue. Um, there is a, an excellent article, Why E-Commerce Won't Work for Africa's Development, on OM's website um, under the digital trade. And obviously, you can go to Ciatini's website also and find lots of really helpful information. Uh, our next speaker is going to be Sonia Reed-Smith. She is a senior researcher with Third World Network, senior researcher and legal advisor. And she analyzes implications of trade and investment agreements on developing and least developed countries. And TWN is a research and advocacy group working to bring about a great articulation of the needs and rights of people in the South, a fair distribution of world resources and forms of development which are ecologically sustainable and fulfill human needs. You have the floor, Sonia. Thank you, Deborah, for that kind introduction. And thank you to the organizers as well for including us and uh, all your hard work in getting this forum together. So um, there's a couple of issues I wanted to touch on. One is continuing on the World Trade Organization um, that both Susanna and Jane have mentioned already. Um, and that is that in uh, the UNCTAD 15 text in paragraph 77 Quinn, it talks about special and differential treatment at the World Trade Organization. And this special and differential treatment at the WTO for developing countries and least developed countries is an integral and agreed part of the architecture of the WTO, because this recognizes the special needs of developing countries and LDCs because of their lower level of development. And we can especially see the difference um, in levels of development in the current crisis, um, because developing countries and LDCs lacked vaccines, as you heard, so then they had to do lockdowns and then all the people unemployed and the businesses losing money, the LDCs in developing countries don't have money to pay uh, to help them the way that developed countries do and so on. So the, the need for this special and differential treatment has become even more clear in the current COVID crisis um, and its consequent uh, economic and social crises. And the recovery from that is going to take some time, as we can all see, especially since um, the shortage of vaccines uh, due to intellectual property monopolies means that um, developing countries and LDCs may not be sufficiently vaccinated for a number of years. So then they will continue to have to use lockdowns, stalling their economy and their development because they have no choice. There's no vaccines for them. And this shortage of supply is because of the intellectual property monopolies. And this could be addressed if European Union United Kingdom and Switzerland agreed to the COVID TRIPS waiver that has been proposed at the World Trade Organization almost a year ago now, and which has been stalled by them. And so there are not sufficient um, companies who can make vaccines, medicines, masks, ventilators, and so on, even though companies are clamoring to be able to manufacture those products and deliver them to developing countries and LDCs, they cannot because of the intellectual property protection and getting rid of this intellectual property protection for these COVID technologies temporarily has been blocked 
by developed countries, especially the EU, UK and Switzerland, and they're still blocking it today in the WTO. So going back to special and differential treatment, um, these provisions and um, strengthening them have been agreed uh, by all WTO members as part of the Doha round. And this was agreed in 2001 that these special and differential treatment provisions would be made more effective and operational. So since then, the G90 has repeatedly and consistently tried to make proposals to address uh, this and improve these special and differential treatment provisions and address the challenges faced by least developed countries and developing countries in the areas of industrialization, structural transformation, meaningful integration into the trade system and so on. But these provisions, these proposals have been blocked by developed countries at the WTO, even though these proposals would help the policy and capacity constraints of the LDCs and developing countries, which are preventing them from taking advantage of the trade system to enable their development. So if these special and differential treatment provisions were agreed, they could provide more stability, predictably, uh, predictability and transparency um, and enable them to take better advantage of the trading system and the benefits that could follow from that. Another area that I wanted to address in the WTO is um, also mentioned in paragraph 77 Quinn of the UNCTAD 15 text. And this is talking about UNCTAD assistance to countries who are joining the WTO. So it's good that UNCTAD um, gives them technical assistance, but unfortunately, countries joining the WTO since 1995 have been asked to make more commitments than the original WTO members. So developing countries and even LDCs have been required to do more than developed countries in terms of greater liberalization of goods and services, stronger intellectual property protection, joining optional plurilateral agreements and so on, even though they're least developed countries. So these WTO plus requirements imposed on them to join the WTO um, are still being negotiated today. There's a number of countries who are in the process of joining the WTO today, including many least developed countries um, in Africa and Asia and so on. Um, and so exceeding countries should not have to agree to these WTO plus provisions, and this should be reflected in the UNCTAN 15 mandate. And then the last area that I wanted to mention that um, comes up in the UNCTAD 15 text is the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. Um, and so that comes up in paragraph 16 bis of the UNCTAD 15 text, where it says um, there have been noteworthy achievements such as the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership or RCEP being concluded. So this free trade agreement was um, between ASEAN and five other countries, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, uh, Korea, and China. And normally in a free trade agreement, the goods chapter where tariffs are removed on a country's exports um, when they come into another country is where developing countries and LDCs would expect to benefit since they are very competitive normally at exporting um, agricultural and manufacturing manufactured products. Other RCEP chapters, um, for example, services, investment, intellectual property, are generally losses for developing countries and LDCs because, for example, all the countries in RCEP are net importers of intellectual property protection except Japan. So the stronger intellectual property protection in the RCEP IP chapter basically helps Japan, but not the other countries. So you would think that the goods chapter at least would help the RCEP developing countries and LDCs. But a recent Boston University study looked at what happens um, when the actual tariffs required to be removed by RCEP are removed. And they found that Japan is the main country whose goods trade balance would improve. It would improve by 98.6% once RCEP takes effect. Whereas RCEP will cause the goods trade balance to worsen for all the ASEAN countries, except Brunei, whose trade balance improves by 0.1%, and even worsen for China. For example, Malaysia's trade balance will worsen by 36.5% if it joins RCEP. In addition, because of removing all these tariffs as required by RCEP, the ASEAN countries in Southeast Asia will lose 3.8 billion US dollars per year in tariff revenue which the study says is a permanent loss of revenue, so can't make it back from other taxes, at a time when governments really need revenue even more than usual to pay for things like COVID vaccines, COVID medicines, which are protected by intellectual property and so at the high monopoly prices, for example, the monoclonal antibodies that keep uh, COVID infected people out of hospital 70% of the time are 2,100 US dollars per dose. And there is a shortage of them worldwide because of intellectual property monopolies, because the COVID trips waiver is being blocked at the WTO by the EU, UK and Switzerland. 
So given this, it's unclear how there are benefits in RCEP for ASEAN and China that outweigh the costs of the chapters like services, investment and intellectual property, since even in the goods chapter, their trade balance worsens. So the chapter where they would be expected to benefit, in fact, they lose, their trade balance worsens, they lose tariff revenue, and the other chapters uh, normally losses anyway for developing countries and LDCs like services, investment and intellectual property. So given this cost benefit analysis doesn't clearly have benefits outweighing the costs, it's not clear to me who um, is the note, who the RCEP being a noteworthy achievement is for, according to the UNCTAD 15 text in paragraph 16 bis, which just claims it's a noteworthy achievement. Sure, certainly Japan benefits from the intellectual property chapter and the goods chapter, but I don't see how the benefits outweigh the costs for the other um, RCEP members. Thank you. Wonderful, Sonia, thank you so much. Uh, that was really a whirlwind of uh, trade issues that were just covered. Uh, it's pretty amazing that um, these three excellent uh, speakers, you know, were able to cover so many issues. I mean, I'm just thinking about the fact that they, you know, called for a recognition in the text uh, that um, UNCTAD should work uh, towards the vaccine waiver uh, in the World Trade Organization. They called for uh, the WTO to be transformed into a multilateral system with sustainable development um, at its core and to conclude the, the development round that has been um, on the agenda for more than 20 years uh, for UNCTAD to really assess the asymmetries and imbalances in the rules and to help countries transform that global trade system to work to spend uh, strengthen, excuse me, special and differential treatment provisions, uh, strengthening food security mechanisms, including through public stockholding, uh, condemning and abolishing unilateral coercive measures um, on certain countries, uh, assessing and, and really the critical uh, impacts of some of these regional agreements um, that uh, have a lot of negative impact and it's not quite clear who the beneficiaries are. Uh, working for more structural transformation, um, including the removal of barriers to the implementation of industrial policy, providing technical assistance to acceding countries and not making it a WTO plus, uh, and strengthening South-South cooperation. So I think they, that's just a quick summary of this amazing presentations on such a diversity of issues from really um, uh, some experts who've been working in this field for quite some time. So thank you all for those uh, amazing presentations. And if you are able to get to that uh, ourworldisnotforsale.net website and you put the word search in after the .net slash and you put uh, Sonia Reed Smith's name or just read R-E-I-D Smith, uh, you will come up with quite a few articles that she has written um, on a number of issues, um, including some of the ones that she mentioned. Um, so I encourage you all, I'm sorry we can't put them in a chat, but, um, but there you are, you can find them on ourworldisnotforsale.net. So I'm going to turn now to the second part of our panel. Uh, we have a, a really wonderful and diverse group, again, uh, coming from uh, all regions of the world, really. Our first speaker for this section will be Sofia Scacerra. Sofia is an economist, researcher, and teacher at the World Labor Institute of the National University Tres de Febrero, better known in Argentina as the Instituto del Mundo de Trabajo de la UNTREF of Argentina, and she's also an advisor to the Latin American Trade Union Movement and to the Labor Commission of the Senate of Argentina. Sofia, you have the floor. Well, thank you, Deborah. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me to such a distinguished panel and such a distinguished group of people. I am delighted uh, that I'm here with you sharing these thoughts. UNCTAD is an organization that has guided countries with research and dedication in their search for data, strategies, and information in order to leap forward in development. In this sense, UNCTAD mandate is key to be able to face a new industrial revolution that is taking place with a global inequality never seen before. In this sense, the emergence of digital technologies and the emergence of data as a raw material concentrated in the hands of a few companies and countries have been the main causes of the accentuated inequality we have experienced so far. The concentrated economic power and the digital raw material in the hands of a few do nothing but kick away the ladder of digital industrialization. How can technologies be developed if the raw material 
is ruthlessly extracted from the global south to the rich countries. How can states benefit from this if the rules that are negotiated prohibit charging taxes or demanding localization or access to this data? Moreover, are we going to continue to defund states in the face of a digital revolution for the few? The digital divide is becoming monstrous in various regions of the world. There are several digital divides. On the one hand, access to technology and connectivity. This requires a huge investment by states and could often result in an opportunity to generate labor or develop technologies within countries instead of waiting for corporations to come and access markets, importing technologies and further impoverishing the terms of trade. On the other hand, there is an educational gap with respect of the uses of technology. This gap is seen in age groups and by gender, but also from the countries of the North to the countries of the global South. This gap requires strong educational programs and strategies for the use of technologies that involve all institutions of society and that cannot be provided solely by transnational companies because they must be designed not only to strengthen the workforce, but also citizenship. Finally, there's a digital economic divide which, as UNCTAD research shows, must be addressed. This gap has to do with the local development of technologies that lead to greater competition, the participation of the state as a fundamental entrepreneur in a weak economies, and a strategy of their articulation with academia that can think of digital industrialization that, rather than mere colonialism 4.0. Efforts to use UNCTAD to serve an agenda of digital giants based in developed countries are the probable and must be stopped. All governments need the policy space to pursue digital industrialization, to create jobs and stimulate innovation in the digital age, free from pernicious impacts on monopoly and economic concentration. They also need policy space to manage data governance in the public interest as an in strengthening quality public services that are essential for development and for the achievement of the sustainable development goals. UNDAC's mandate seems to go in another direction with respect of the interests of developing countries. They seem to put multinational corporations on the forefront of thinking about development strategies and not the civil society, trade unions, governments, another, and, and the people in general in favor of their own interest. Thus, private investment strategies are proposed as the only possible engine of economic development. And what about public investment? The literature teaches us that the role that states have played in industrialization and damage management in economic crisis has been key to sustain entire societies from falling into poverty, but even more so from advancing towards a richer society. In this regard, the, ne the negative impacts of investment policies, including those enacted by UNCTAD in the past, such as those with investor state dispute settlement mechanism, must be acknowledged. It is not just that the expansion of investment has not benefited all, but the, that developing countries have been actively harmed, even according to UNCTAD's research. Investment rules must not only be clear and predictable, but must also facilitate developing countries' development priorities and the, reach, the right to regulate, while ensuring that the states returns the ability to hold corporations accountable. UNCTAD's roles should focus on increasing foreign direct investment, not in terms of volume, but in line with national development priorities and advocating frameworks that place development at the heart of policies and practices governing investment flows. In particular, I found paragraph 112.8 particularly problematic. Allow me to be skeptical about the wording of this clause. <laughs> I come from a country that signed almost 50 bilateral investment treaties and had lost the most ISDS cases, a system that has sucked some millions of Argentines into poverty. It had cost us dearly in terms of fiscal resources and has not brought any investment to the country other than speculative capital. Argentina has had the best investment when the state was articulated, articulated consumption and investment policies, 
with a rise in real wages and access to technology for all. Definitely subject, subjecting a country to rules that cost millions in fiscal terms and plunge countries into poverty is not the way to generate income. Nobody does business with the poor, but with those who have purchasing power and a big market. Latin America understands well what a digital transformation implies without us. We know what is to sell raw materials, what the world industrializes. We know what it what it is to ruthlessly weaken our terms of trade. Raul Prebisch theorized from these regions on how to overcome these difficulties. And his writings, which are so close to UNCTAD's mandates, we find that we can only leap to development with more state presence and regulatory capacity, sharing the benefits for many, but above all with strategy. And strategy implies researching, thinking, discovering and rethinking again, not leaving everything in the hands of one sector of society, the transnational corporations. The way out is with everyone, but with freedom of maneuverability and information. In this sense, I believe that UNCTAD has a lot to do in this new digital industrial revolution, helping countries to achieve digital industrialization with intelligent strategies, but above all, following the interest of each country and magnifying the capabilities that many of them already have in place. Eliminating the incipient technology that is developed in Latin America in the hands of unequal competition with digital corporations not only implies subsuming us in underdevelopment, but also generates monopolistic technologies that are less diverse and more cultural, economic, and social imperialism. Another world is possible, and we need an intelligent UNCTAD to help us build it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sophia, and a great introduction to some of the key issues uh, in UNCTAD's mandate, uh, particularly with regard to digitalization and the key investment issues, which uh, UNCTAD is, uh, as we know, a focal point for. Um, our next speaker is going to pick up uh, where Sophia introduced us um, to some key digitalization issues. Parminder Jeet Singh from IT for Change in India. And IT for Change um, is an uh, India-based organization that works for a society in which digital technologies contribute to human rights, social justice, and equity. And he has been uh, a special advisor to the UN's Internet Governance Forum and has worked in just about every instance of internet governance for the last uh, several decades. Uh, and he is a founding member of the JustNet Coalition. Uh, without further ado, please, Parminder, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, uh, Debra. Uh, and thanks to the organizers, especially the Caribbean Policy Development Center for arranging uh, this uh, event. Uh, I would uh, try to put my presentation in two parts. Uh, one would be more general about uh, UNCTAD's mandate in light of digitalization uh, and uh, whether the current document uh, in general is meeting uh, what is uh, required in that sense. And the second part, I'll try to go to the more specific language of the document where improvements uh, could be made. Now, UNCTAD was set up with a clear purpose. It was not just uh, to promote trade, uh, which uh, was being uh, promoted by other organizations, but Bretton Woods and GATT apart, uh, the need was to be openly partisan to uh, developing countries and to see not just uh, the benefits of more trade, more investment, more industry, uh, but to see it in terms of uh, what has been called as the central periphery model and how things are structured in such a way uh, that the centers would keep on amassing powers at the expense of periphery and it's just not some kind of an ballooning or expansion of the center in which one day everybody would uh, be on a similar uh, plane. Uh, now, now, fast forward uh, to the digital world. Uh, digital world uh, is generally has been considered at least uh, in the first uh, decade of this millennium as something which flattens the world, their books, by that name, whereby anybody who gets on the network is therefore on the same level, et cetera, and so on. And therefore, it is felt that the need of uh, uh, kind of uh, perpetuating 
discussions on the center periphery model or exclusions of structural exclusions of that kind uh, are not that relevant today and it's just about getting on the network and uh, therefore uh, unfortunately unted also seem to have taken the same stance uh, it has started to take the stance what other organizations multilateral organizations says that it is about having more digitalization of the kind which is already happening uh, in various parts of the world uh, in more or less a similar way and that's where the problem starts because there is a big discontinuity with digitalization not the kind which people say that it flattens the world but the opposite kind and my case here is that it actually is even more centralizing than the industrial age systems and i i see the digital age systems as fundamentally different from industrial age systems and the kind of economic forces they unleash and the uh, economic convergences divergences decentralization centralization that uh, starts happening uh, is fundamentally different and the bad news is that it is worse the centralizing power of intelligence which is the central component of a digital economy or data is many times over and it's uh, it's anecdotal uh, knowledge is there with all of you moment one company becomes dominant becomes dominant in one area there's almost no place for a second company it's never happened in the industrial era at least there were always four or five big oil majors and there were four or five uh, big uh, you know consumer product majors they always uh, plays for at least 4 10 or 15 players and even some domestic players but doesn't happen in in the digital area so that is our biggest problem and untad has not actually taken up the challenge of trying to show how in the area of digitalization centralization and the center periphery model is even more acute and therefore what would be corresponding model for developing countries which could structurally uh, transform the way digitalization is otherwise taking up and uniquely it's a job of untad to do this because nobody else can do it the country capacities are very low in this case simply because the phenomenon moves very fast i come from india which has relatively more capacities among developing countries and we we don't have a digital economy plan most of us also know whatever little thinking digital econ on digital economy developing countries have done is because developed countries especially us became overactive at wto and was trying to preempt certain industrialization policies whereby developing countries came up and said oh, i see something is wrong i don't see the data flows could be a good thing however there is nothing concrete there's no model whereby a developing country can say well some version of this alternative model mixed with the mainstream model we are not going uh, talking about polarities but some alternative structural model is what we are talking about not a single developing country not a single unfortunately fortunately center in developing countries have that kind of model and therefore it's uniquely the responsibility of untad to propagate that model and what i see the problem is that it is not doing it it does bring out a digital economy report where it normally highlights the same kind of critiques of dominant digital uh, economy uh, which are spoken of in the us uh, or or in europe uh, about competition some kind of uh, ai transparency and you know data stewardship and those kind of things which are already been spoken in the west and it simply highlights those rather than showing what is structurally different for developing countries and they have completely failed in doing that and the current document uh, which is being negotiated is also largely about uh, more of the same i mean the future has arrived it's simply not been distributed well enough is the take they are taking so first of all in their uh, in their preamble language they need to recognize the fact that digitalization of certain kind is taking place that's not the only model of digitalization and anybody who talks about a different structural model is not against digitalization we can't be against digitalization in the same way we could not have been against industrialization but we are talking about a structurally different model and start constructing at least at the highest level some components of that model and they are around and i'll come come to them towards the end if i have uh, have time now coming to some of the concrete language which we have a uh, problem with Uh, I, i would uh, talk about first about there is a, there is a, i mean data flow has been the thing which really you know irk the uh, of the developing countries uh, to seeing there was some problem but still untad has a language which calls for data 
flow with trust. Now, this is a variation on a language uh, which was developed at G20 Osaka, where it was free flow, data free flow with trust. They just removed the free and they said data flow with trust, but which is still bad enough. We don't want just data flow with trust. We want any kind of data systems which has economic rights of communities, countries, users recognized. Uh, now, South Africa recently has come up with a policy document which talks about data as a national resource. Similar documents are being developed in India. Now, they need to get up and say to the country, the data is a national resource. It is not a matter of trust, which generally is a code word for privacy and security. I'm not going to give it up just because this privacy and security is ensured. I only would give it up if my economic rights are ensured in the same way I made deposit money in a Swiss bank only under my own name if its ownership is clearly recognized. So data ownership has to be data flow with trust or completely remove it. Second thing which really needs to be removed from there is this term called multi-stakeholder approach. Now, I think the problem here comes because uh, most uh, negotiators at UNCTAD do not know the history of World Summit for Information Society discussions which more or less are entirely divided between developed countries and developing countries on multilateral versus multi-stakeholder world. Multi-stakeholder world is clearly recognized there uh, as representing a uh, big corporates, big tech dominated, uh, more or less non-governance systems, those kind of advisory systems at the expense of any kind of UN agencies on digital issues, which has been the demand of developing countries for so long. And G77 has specific resolutions which says, okay, we are happy to have consultation with all uh, stakeholders. But the point here is that before that, we have to have a multilateral policy making body, which is not being given to developing countries. So putting here the word multi-stakeholder approach is a code word of saying we do not need a multilateral global governance body for digital uh, issues, which is not the stand of G77. And even if you have to use multi-stakeholder approach, you have to mention that the policy role of the governments is uh, to be uh, ensured, which is a code language which is being used at the World Summit uh, discussions throughout. And the and the. Another thing is that though there is a language on certain framework rules on platform, but it is strange that even a developing country club is not ready to just go up and clearly say that we need to diffuse platform power, we need to decentralize the digital economy. And very important point is that we need to empower the actors which are dependent on platforms. And by this term, I mean the Uber drivers, the Amazon uh, traders on uh, Amazon, small restaurants and hoteliers vis-a-vis uh, -vis BNB, ANR, BNB, uh, even small apps developers vis-a-vis -vis the Apple App Store or the Google App Stores. All these platform dependent actors are very big parts of the economy today and there's no sentence, no language at all trying to talk about their interests. And the very last point, which connects to where I started with, is that I am completely surprised that why UNCTAD is not even ready to use the word digital industrial policy in just a general sense. I'm not even yet going into the elements of it, which I may not have time to describe. But why can't you even just mention digital industrial policy? Because we are into times, first of all, where the term industrial policy is being reclaimed even by the US, who has been the one who consistently opposes it in the global forums, uh, not only in the context of COVID, where they have started to talk about reinsuring their supply chains uh, are domestic for major uh, important uh, supply chains are, are domestic, but very specifically in the technology center, there's a huge uh, amount of industrial policy implications, not only industrial policy things, but almost mercantilism, where the Chinese uh, biggies talk with the government and together uh, go out and not only meet the economic interests, but also military and surveillance interests. So with China, where the big tech and the government are together when preserving the American economic interest, but again, surveillance interest and military interest. I mean, there's a big fight about making chips, as you know, that all these countries are trying to see that the chips are manufactured in respective countries, and chip is the lowest layer of the digital stack. And we are talking about cloud computing, we are talking about artificial intelligence engines, and everybody's ensuring that they are uh, not 
coming from outside. And therefore, the industrial policy world should, if US and China are doing it, at least the UNCTAD can use the word digital industrial policy. And I don't have time to uh, elaborate five or six major elements of it, but they are generally known. And these are the kind of things one would be expecting for UNCTAD giving the next five year mandate for itself, which I find uh, missing uh, in the document. Thank you. Thank you so much, Parminder. Uh, that was really illuminative as far as uh, what UNCTAD's mandate should be. I think um, at the first part of the discussion, we heard from some speakers about how there really needs to be a turnaround in the trade work away from only helping countries address uh, adjust to a bad system into really reclaiming the reason for UNCTAD's existence. Um, more than half a century ago, which is to transform the current system into a development-centered global trade uh, rules and system. And now we're hearing a call for a transformation really of the approach of the technology work. Uh, it seems like UNCTAD is doing great work addressing the digital divide in terms of you know, access to the internet, but we know that that divide is really shrinking. And we really need much more robust work focusing on addressing the digital economic divide. Who is benefiting from uh, digitalization? and really moving a, a, a global system more in favor of digital industrialization and data in the public good policies, uh, as well as helping countries really make this important transition. Um, so I'm gonna introduce our last speaker. Uh, last but not least, um, Adam uh, Wolfenden is uh, the trade justice campaigner with the Pacific Network on Globalization, PANG, uh, which is based in Fiji and is a regional watchdog promoting Pacific people's right to be self-determining. And he's been working there for more than a decade on uh, all kinds of different trade agreements and against resource gra uh, grabbing. Adam Wolfenden, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Deborah. And I'd just like to extend my welcome to all the distinguished uh, ambassadors, the UNCTAD members, and my civil society colleagues. Uh, I'd also like to start by uh, acknowledging the country that I'm currently on. I'm based in Australia and live on the unceded Wabakul lands. Uh, as Deborah mentioned, Pang is a Pacific Islands based uh, civil society organization. Um, and, and a lot of what I wanna to speak to tonight is to, bring, is to bring that kind of perspective of, from the Pacific Islands to, to these conversations. Um, the previous speakers have done a fantastic job of, I think, outlining a lot of the, the issues um, that, are, that are being played out with UNCTAD and its mandate discussions. And uh, Pang and myself would really like to, I think, just re-endorse a lot of what has been said, said tonight, uh, or today, <laughs> as, as we are. Um, one thing I wanted to start off and to really frame my comments around is the importance of UNCTAD's work being ground um, in the reality of people's lives. And I think this is something that must be driven by a reflection on the challenge that currently face developing countries and Pacific Island countries um, and the reasons for these challenge. So global inequality, economic concentration, th these aren't increasing by accident. A lot of the environmental challenges that are being faced uh, involve a disproportionate level of responsibility. So you can apply that to climate change, you can apply that to the global depletion of fishery stocks. Um, and when we're talking about this grounding UNCTAD's work in a reality, for the Pacific, this reality includes an abundance of ocean, natural resource, traditional and cultural wealth. Um, but there are also challenges for this. There's the increased frequency and severity of natural disasters. And th these things upend any development plan. And to provide some examples of this, uh, tropical cyclone Evan caused the damage equivalent of 30% of Samoa's GDP. Um, while the damage from um, tropical cyclone Pan it was, was the economic equivalent of half of Vanuatu's GDP. So we're seeing the enormous impact that these natural disasters have. On top of this, there are, you know, for the Pacific Islands, there is a long distance to markets. There are small populations. There's inconsistent infrastructure. There's economies ranging in GDP size from $30 million to uh, $23 billion. So there's, it's quite diverse, it's quite challenging. Um, Jane also captured, I think, what was a very similar experience in the Pacific of, 
you know, a, a large concentration of exporting raw materials only to import finished products. And the challenges that are faced by that, that imbalance of trade. And in saying that, this promotion and the language of trade liberalization and the removal of barriers to trade, it's important to understand that they're not development outcomes. Uh, in the Pacific, many of the countries have custom land-based um, management systems. And these are traditional systems that have supported Pacific Island communities for generations. Yet because they don't grant individual ownership title and, and fit in neatly to free trade uh, understandings, they're considered barriers to trade. So these are the, the systems, the, the underground systems that are constantly targeted by um, the free trade mantra. And so when we see language like that's contained in, in 77 Quinn, it needs to be explicit that the goal isn't liberalization of trade. The goal is sustainable community-centered development outcomes. Um, and so, you know, we, we're seeing this disconnect between what is being promoted, what is being pushed in this liberalization, but it it's, doesn't apply to the vulnerabilities of Pacific Island countries. The G77's language under 60, um, article, paragraph 60, sorry, most accurately acknowledges the realities of natural disasters for developing countries, especially the small island development states, and the breadth of impacts that this has on development goals. It's hard to maintain and export industries when crops are destroyed and infrastructure is ruined on a periodic yet frequent, uh, increasingly frequent basis. So the incorporation of this proposed language into paragraph eight is a major reduction in the scope and the understanding of these challenges that Pacific Island countries face. And it's these challenges that are essential for UNCTAD to acknowledge and, and work towards addressing. And so moving on from that, we, you know, th this approach of taking a very, I think, clear-eyed assessment of the challenges and the reasons for those challenges that countries are facing, that also has to apply to bilateral and regional trade agreements and the role that they play in exacerbating um, global inequalities. So uh, as Sonia and Jane have mentioned, this idea of praising some of these agreements as noteworthy achievements. Um, however, UNCTAD really needs to critically assess the impacts on trade and development of these, of these agreements, including the Pacific Agreement on Closer Economic Relations Plus. Um, PESA Plus, as it's known, in, instead should be considered a cautionary tale. PESA Plus resulted in an, a very imbalanced agreement. So we're seeing WTO Plus commitments being demanded from developing and least developed countries, including some of the smallest economies in the world. And a lot of, in, also these members, the, sorry, these countries aren't even members of the WTO, yet they're going beyond what other countries have committed in the WTO. Yet they were offered no new market access in return. So the pace of plus was so imbalanced that the two biggest island economies ref, did, didn't part participate in the final agreement. And largely this was done on account of concerns for the domestic industrial capacity, as well as having the policy space for future development. Other concerns with PESA Plus are coming from governments and their concerns about the ability to generate revenue. Um, one of the PESA Plus parties is now considering sourcing adjustment funds to deal with revenue loss from tariff cuts. Um, you know, that said there are, you know, with the interests of the developing of the Pacific Island countries within this agreement were represented only, however, in two non-binding arrangements. These are on labor mobility, so the movement of people and development assistance. And a key lesson, I think, from these agreements is that they need to be guaranteed. These interests for these countries must be uh, locked up in, within the agreement as part of the agreement. And so we're already seeing within the, you know, the, amongst the Peace Plus parties, changes to the labour mobility environment from Australia. We're seeing that the development assistance promises are all coming from existing aid allocations. This is not new money. These are not guaranteed. Um, this is not a guarantee of development by any stretch. The inclusion of development assistance within Peace Plus is something that I think is a welcomed addition. But the imbalance is that it, it's not binding, like I was saying, the market commitments that Pacific Island countries are undertaking and have, you know, were part of the agreement. The other aspect is the programs that this assistance might fund, they may be fantastic and worthwhile projects, um, 
they don't require a reciprocal free trade agreement for those general governments to fund them. There is no requirement within PESA Plus um, or for PESA Plus to be able to fund and you know, implement these, these programs and these projects that are on the ground what the Pacific Island countries are saying that they need. Instead, what we're seeing is they have to give up, make market access commitments in goods, services, investment, and other areas for those donor governments. That's the price they're paying. So for UNCTAD, praising such agreements as, as noteworthy achievements in paragraph 16, it ignores the lessons of the text and merely it, it provides a favorable political outcome. So only 15% of Pacific Island economies are included in the agreement. And so it's hard to see PESA Plus being this achievement for regional integration, um, let alone addressing those structural challenges that Pacific Island countries are having to deal with. So for UNCTAD, the, it's important to learn, like it needs to learn from these experiences. And I think that starts with undertaking a very honest assessment of what these, these deals are. Another critical area for the Pacific um, Pacific Island countries relates to fishery subsidies and oceans in general. So paragraph 60 highlights the need to preserve the planet. However, this goal is being failed by the WTO sub fishery subsidies negotiations. So these negotiations are marked by deep divisions over the imbalances in the text. What's being currently proposed is a, is a permanent carve out for the, essentially for the large industrial fishing nations who have that historical responsibility for exhausting the fishery stocks while the developing countries are only offered a time and geographically bound flexibility. The current trajectory of, these, of the text is, is, will fail both sustainability and development. Um, the sustainability goals that are discussed around the text and the impetus, I think, most recently given to their conclusion, um, fa it, it fails to rein in those with that responsibility of depleting the fish stocks for the state of the global fisheries that we're currently in. It provided, you know, the current proposals allowed capacity enhancing subsidies to continue provided that a member can pr prove that fishing is sustainable. And what this will mean is that this effectively provides this permanent carve out to those WTO members who have large industrial fleets and the capacity to argue that their management systems are sustainable. Further to this and undermining the sustainability objective is that it opens up the WTO to be an arbiter of the conservation and management measures of those member states. By requiring members to prove that their management measures are done sustainably, it leaves those same measures open to challenge. And what this will do is hand a body like the WTO that has no expertise in fisheries management, the ability to make determinations on whether or not a member's conservation measures are sustainable. Further, the current proposals will undermine the development prospects of fisheries. So small scale fishers uh, in developing countries are heavily reliant on subsidies for their livelihoods, yet they face the prospect of having that support taken away if they don't fit in a very narrowly defined criteria. Um, and there are also additional prohibitions on the ability of countries to support fishers and, the, and it removes this possibility of nurturing domestic industrial fishing and having members reap the benefits of fishing their own sovereign waters. So the imbalances in these negotiations are clear, yet the mandate on special differential treatment is, con is constantly being discussed as a problem or, or a hurdle for these negotiations. The language in paragraph 60 of the UNCTAD mandate acknowledges Sustainable Development Goal 14.6. However, it's quite concerning that the inclusion of that language was considered contentious for, for this ministerial. So the principle of sustainable, oh sorry, the principle of special differential treatment is mandated by world leaders and the reaffirming of this mandate should not have been opposed within these talks. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I'll conclude here by saying, you know, it's sort of building on, I think what a lot of other speakers have said today is that the task ahead for UNCAD is quite enormous, but it, to ensure that it's headed, the work that it does is headed in the right direction for development, for sustainability, it has to start by addressing the causes of the challenges that are currently facing development, both today and what's planned for the future. And I think this starts with acknowledging the current failings of global trade and liberalization and bravely charting a path to a better world. Thanks very much.
Thank you very much, Adam. Um, I just am conscious of the fact that our panel has done a whirlwind tour really uh, from uh, the Pacific, uh, India, Argentina, uh, Uganda. We have this incredibly diverse panel here and you see the importance of having that expertise uh, from around the world, um, and but really also the, the unity of many of the speakers and the points that they've made. One thing I've noticed from all the speakers uh, that I'd like to make a specific point about the text. Many of you know uh, Unctad very well. You know that its work is conceptualized as having three pillars, research and analysis, intergovernmental consensus building, and technical cooperation. And really the consensus building and technical cooperation pillars of UNCTAD should obviously be based, I think most of us would agree, on evidence. Um, and that is on the outcomes identified by the analysis and research. And for those who have access to the text in the latest publicly available one on the UNCTAD website, I think it's dated from September 7th. And there's a particular paragraph there, paragraph 6, 96 bis primus, which is actually a naked attempt to censor a priori the independence of the analytical pillar. And we uh, would like to call out and criticize certain members of Group B who have in recent months engaged in censoring research publications of UNCTAD that were well within its mandate. Now in no other UN institution is research subject to a biennial review in which topics for research that are well within the negotiated mandate must be relitigated before the board. This paragraph should be removed for the institution to function according to its mandate. And really, it should be the policy recommendations of the other pillars of consensus building and technical cooperation, which should be subject to review as to whether or not they are coherent with the outcomes of research and analysis to ensure that they are evidence-based. And I just wanna give one specific example related to some of the issues that my co-panelists have brought up this morning with regards to the digitalization and technology work. Now, some people, not all, and the division has not called for this, but some people in UNCTAD have called for countries to join the digital trade rules in the WTO. Quite shocking uh, because we know that these rules were proposed by the lawyers of Google and Amazon and Facebook, et cetera. They were first uh, introduced by the United States really to grab data from around the world um, and to prevent uh, public interest regulation, particularly by consolidating cross-border data transfers and what they euphemistically call free flow of data and data flows with trust, which Parminder mentioned. And I say that you use these words euphemistically because they're never talking about data flowing to developing countries. They're always talking about data from all countries, from workers around the world, from consumers and producers around the world, from MSMEs around the world, flowing to transnational corporations. So we really need some more robust work against those global proposed global trade rules that are being negotiated in the World Trade Organization. And it is only one of three joint statement initiatives that we know are being negotiated in the WTO along with investment facilitation and domestic regulation negotiations. So there was an excellent paper earlier this year, an UNCTAD research paper on the joint statement initiative on e-commerce and the economic and fiscal implications for the global South that was published earlier this year. And unfortunately, I have to uh, let you all know that this paper was censored. It was removed from the research papers section of UNCTAD website. But this really is evidence-based research that should lead the direction of other work by UNCTAD um, on these issues. And what are some of those things that were mentioned uh, just now by our colleagues? The work to reduce economic concentration should be front and center given uh, the fact that this is one of the most significant problems of the global economy that is affecting developing countries' prospects for using trade for development. It's conspicuously absent as was mentioned. And this is true for the technology sector, but it's actually true in every sector. If we talk about agriculture concentration or any kind of sector, there is a problem of economic concentration leading to the rentier economy and uh, corporations um, making profit, uh, excessive profit, uh, while not uh, producing very much. And this is obviously related to financialization as well. Uh, there's also, I see from my colleagues, a call for, uh, as we said before, a turnaround in the trade work, but also a turnaround in the technology work, focusing more on all three pillars, on digital industrialization, digital industrial policies, intelligence strategies, magnifying domestic capabilities, a focus on the value of data for developing countries and its use and governance in the public interest. And this is something I would like to emphasize, the importance of data as a public good. 
the importance of data being available for public interest, such as strengthening public services, cannot be underestimated. And we think that this is something that UNCTAD should put more emphasis on. Addressing unequal competition with transnational corporations working against digital monopolies, Excising references from data flow with trust and multi-stakeholder, which has really allowed uh, far too much corporate influence um, in uh, this work at UNCTAD and should be uh, really refocused. Uh, and then also our speakers talked about uh, the importance of affirming the special and differential treatment mandate in the fisheries sector. And as we know, uh, as, as uh, Adam pointed out, the goal is not increased trade, but sustainable development centered outcomes. I thought that was a great uh, point. And recognizing the challenges that countries are facing from climate disasters uh, is so important, as well as the disadvantages from regional trade agreements. I'll just go ahead and mention a couple of things. Uh, also, from the text that the technology transfer really must be emphasized as a solution, which UNCTAD's three pillars should be mobilized to accelerate. And any references to uh, mutually agreed terms should be excised because technology transfer is a right of developing countries to require. Uh, we also believe that UNCTAD's efforts to support the transition to a just, sustainable, and fully inclusive economy, such as UNCTAD's work to promote a Green New Deal, should actually be held up and strengthened in the text. In addition, there is, uh, uh, we know, a lot of climate-related tariffs on developing country production and exports, and this uh, is a concern for developing countries using trade for development and should be studied um, by UNCTAD. And... Um, then also, of course, is the important investment work uh, that UNCTAD has done, and that is um, should be, uh, obviously, as, as uh, Sophia mentioned, facilitating developing countries' development priorities and the right to regulate while ensuring that, that states are able to hold corporations uh, accountable, and that UNCTAD's role should really focus on increasing FDI, not in volume terms, as Sophia mentioned, but in accordance with national development priorities. So that is a, a, a bit of review of some of these uh, latest speakers. And now um, I'm gonna have the honor to introduce uh, one more uh, person to our panel right now. And this is uh, Ambassador Gothami Silva. She is the ambassador and permanent representative of Sri Lanka to the WTO. And uh, she has been involved in some of these negotiations and we are delighted to have this very esteemed ambassador to respond to some of the civil society comments and also to share your experience uh, with how these negotiations uh, have been going. Uh, so please ambassador, you have the floor and please share with us um, any of your insights that you would like to on all of these issues and uh, the negotiations. Ambassador, you have the floor. Um, yes, uh, Debra, uh, am I loud and clear? Yes. Yes. Thank you first, uh, Deborah, uh, for inviting uh, me, uh, despite uh, all your other engagements and, and uh, certainly having such a trust on, on, on me uh, to intervene as, a, as an active uh, delegate of this WTO negotiations. Uh, first, uh, let me express my, um, my concerns, particularly it's very disturbing to observe that the civil society has been repeatedly denied uh, the access to contributing actively throughout the process of this negotiations towards UNCTAD 15 mandate. And uh, I actually noted uh, these concerns uh, uh, close to uh, maybe just a couple of uh, months ago. And uh, we had, I think, through my, my colleagues, uh, we have raised these interventions, uh, these concerns uh, in the WTO. Now, I think, uh, as, um, as you may know, although many paragraphs are agreed as of today, uh, there are many key issues uh, of the text still uh, under consideration for which the expertise and the perspectives of the civil society would be essential and must be heard. And today, I think uh, many experts uh, d uh, alluded to us and demonstrated as to why we should be very cautious uh, with some of the languages, uh, paragraphs that are included in, the, in this text. Um, uh, when this is not happening, uh, it's our duty to inject the pertinent perspective of civil society into the text by way of alternate formulations. Uh, that is uh, the, 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 uh, the duty of uh, developing countries like us who really want uh, the UNCTAD institution to stand 
uh, to its uh, proper uh, context and proper uh, purpose. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I was so dear to the Angtad institution, even as a student in the, in the university, when we were told about the South-South dialogue and the North-South North dialogue, and uh, where I, I understood how important the Angtad as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a forum for developing countries. Uh, the extension of expertise and perspective of civil society is mostly sought after by many developing countries, uh, like mine, who lack the time and capacity to engage in meaningful and time-consuming analytical work on many key areas of interest. Accordingly, uh, Sri Lanka is pleased to note that the civil society is making significant contributions to enhance the capacities of those developing countries, which are in disadvantaged situations. I therefore wish to thank all those civil society organizations for, their, for having taken such remarkable initiatives uh, uh, and even under this uh, uh, ambit of the UNCTAD uh, conference. And I know that you will be doing so to help us even leading up to MC12. As stated by many today, the text does not any, in any way measure up to the current and interconnected economic health, food security, and social and environmental crisis that developing countries are facing. The entire narrative of the developed and certain advanced developing countries, sad to say this one, focuses on one argument, that is the developing countries lack the capacity to derive benefits of the system, leading up to the creation of disparity in reaping benefits by them. Under this false narrative, I think the civil society has picked up this, this remarkable um, differentiation. What is uh, their solution is that the UNCTAD should come forward to assist developing countries to adjust more, uh, to take advantage of the benefits of the trade, uh, investment and digitalization. Uh, this is an issue similar to chicken and egg issue. If the origin of the problems of today's world is not accurately assessed and reflected, then the solutions will not resolve this crisis. The current draft on the UNCTAD text uh, does, not, uh, does not strengthen the work of the UNCTAD particularly in uh, relation to the finance, debt, South-South cooperation, investment, technology transfer, and more, and in some areas, such as on some trade and investment issues, uh, which goes in the right di uh, wrong direction. When I looked at the, the, the text, uh, particularly from the investment point of view, because I thought that I would be focusing more on the investment uh, side of it, uh, though it's not a very dear subject to me, like fisheries and agriculture, but I like uh, to focus on investment today, as many uh, speakers had dwelt on, on other areas. Now, if you look at the art paragraphs 87, then 91, and uh, there, I think uh, just Mia's uh, statement that the international investment regime should be continued and better to integrate sustainable development goals. And then they go in to say that investment protection uh, agreements should be concluded and, and, and such and such, you know, some elements. But when it comes to the role of UNCTAD in relation to investment, it's, it, the, the paragraphs are trying to really limit the, the scope of the UNCTAD intervention. Uh, when you uh, are inundated with so many negotiating forums in WTO, and as Deborah mentioned, the joint initiative on investment, I think you, when you look at, there are a lot of countries who had uh, gone into this negotiation, joined these negotiations, but only there are only very few countries who, who feel, still feel, uh, that the, the environment is not conducive uh, for them to join that one. Now, uh, in the area of investment alone, now what is UNCTAD role? I think UNCTAD uh, is, is boasting that it has a division which is called Investment Enterprise Division. And it is considered to be a global center of excellence on all issues related to investment and enterprise development. It further say, states that the investment currently does not have any global institutional arrange, uh, arrangement to oversee its governance, unlike trade or finance. Therefore, the division plays a valuable role in supporting the international investment community. Does the text recognize this unique role to be played by UNCTAD in the area of investment and, it, uh, and accord 
it with more emphasis on the diversity of uh, delivery of uh, a leading uh, ed edge policy analysis. Now, are these uh, lang are these aspects reflected in the text? And I see they are uh, absolutely absent uh, in, in in the text. And also, uh, the, it has a role in, in, in consensus building and assisting developing countries in technical assistance. Now, Deborah mentioned that the consensus building and technical assistance are also somewhat diluted. But the leading role when it comes to uh, building con international consensus on investment related issues in general and on global international arrangement, uh, investment uh, facilitation in particular. The UNCTAD has been sidelined and prevented from delivering its own original mandates. Even the donors who are funding some of the programs in the UNCTAD, and for that matter, even in, in WGO, under this pillar, dictate terms to the UNCTAD secretariat as to what they, what they see should be the focus and help them build consensus, consensus on issues which favor them leaving behind the accurate account, account of implications with empirical data, conceal benefits with empirical data, and pitfalls of such international arrangements on developing countries. There is a dearth of research and, and analysis on individual country situations. So they can take, if they, they are available, so that can, they can take well-informed and considered views and decisions before even they join such negotiations. In the absence of UNCTAD inputs, uh, thanks to many civil society organizations like the DEBRAS, uh, the NGOs, and the Third World Network, the South Center, which have come forward to help many developing countries, uh, certain developing countries are reluctant to join these bilateral negotiations taking place within the WTO as they tend to take away their policy space in areas of interest to them. I think many, uh, 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 many of our, our uh, experts today said that the, at the speaker from Africa, she said some of these uh, uh, policy recommendations are sugar-coated. Certainly, uh, yes, it, it, is the, it is the case because uh, when you, and recently one of our, my experience, very close experience, and there was a, an, a particular uh, research institute to, which approached us to, you know, to do a empirical study on Sri Lanka because they know Sri Lanka is absent in many days. So they really wanted Sri Lanka to con get you know, converse that you should be joining. So they were thinking of uh, doing certain country analysis on, on certain uh, JSI initiatives. So they shared with me a uh, terms of reference. And I, when I looked at it, it is completely a sugar coating exercise. So that is what uh, we see that um, uh, in some of the uh, research and analysis, analytical work that the proposals that we get on those uh, areas uh, we, we cannot really uh, entertain such requests because they, they, their purpose and the objective is somewhat different. That is to uh, give a good picture that Sri Lanka should be joining. So therefore, uh, the UNCTAD, uh, the, the role of analytical, cap, you know, uh, building consensus through its research and analytical capacity is the key to unfold many of these, uh, these um, uh, you know, uh, uh, areas where the developing countries would be forthcoming uh, with certain uh, negotiations. And even in the fishery, now what has UNCTAD done in the area of fisheries? I think we really needed UNCTAD to come in. And I didn't, because UNCTAD, on the other hand, uh, in co coordination with UNEP, they're addressing the plastic pollution, uh, the marine pollution, the plastic pollution in at sea. Of course, if you look at the overall uh, sustainability level of the fishery resources today, it's not only due to subsidies that the the resources have been exp uh, have been uh, have been um, uh, you know uh, have been uh, depleting. It is also due to plastic pollution at sea, marine pollution, microplastic pollution. So the resource the fishery resources are depleting. So there are a lot of other areas that the, the you know, the UNCTAD should be engaging, but they're only focusing on plastic pollution. Maybe it is the donor donor funding uh, initiatives, but nothing on, on, you know, to help developing countries to better safeguard their, their 
small scale farmers, uh, fisher, fishermen uh, in these negotiations. So I, I think I stop here, um, leaving many other um, interventions to uh, come in. Uh, but certainly, uh, I don't know whether we are too late, uh, Deborah, in injecting the, the kind of uh, the, the very robust um, and uh, very uh, developing country supportive formulations that you, you have uh, really, the, the, ent the entire civil society had given us. Certainly we are making best effort to bring them to the table and then um, negotiate uh, a good outcome where we continue to have the UNCTAD's relevance, uh, uh, which may not be so different to its, um, uh, its main um, objective of establishing the UNCTAD uh, in 1964. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Silva, for those really uh, important comments from somebody who has been uh, involved in this process for so long. And uh, it's really incredible to hear your insights. And we as civil society really appreciate um, your concerns about uh, our, our voices not being uh, held up enough. Uh, it's really unfortunate. Normally there is a CSO hearing that is convened uh, by the Secretariat that didn't happen uh, and we did not get access to the text until the very last minute. So we're very glad to be able to have this forum today. Uh, we hope also that the Secretariat will be facilitating for many of us to be uh, speaking civil society in general, to be speaking on the actual UNCTAD uh, forum uh, in October uh, and so that we can also share some of our expertise there. So thank you so much for your leadership uh, in the negotiations among developing countries. Um, and we very much resonate with many of the concerns that you have brought up. Um, I would like to um, turn now to be able to uh, answer some of the questions uh, that have been brought up because we have a uh, not so much time left, but I understand that there is uh, an, another person, a private sector representative, who is interested in joining the panel. Um, if we can uh, turn to Julian, please. Um, oh, there he is. He is there. I haven't seen his name on the Zoom. So, uh, but go ahead, Julian. You have the floor uh, for five minutes, please. Go ahead. Hi, 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 Deborah. Thank you very much. Thanks for the time and thanks for this opportunity. Um, I've been listening uh, intently to the discussions and I'm coming to you from the beautiful island of Barbados, a small island development state. And I think that in the small time that we have uh, available, what I'd like to do is just highlight again uh, from moving from the, these policies and seeing what is actually on the ground now, the challenges. Um, some Parminda started talking about it, but specifically in this as we say, the fourth industrial revolu um, revolution, we're talking about e-commerce. Uh, in the islands of the Caribbean, e-commerce obviously has, has skyrocketed specifically um, in this COVID time. Uh, now, obviously, moving everything online. Um, and the challenges there are, are the realities of the situation are we want to be doing this trade um, but the cost of doing business compared to the rest of the world significantly increased. So we're talking about um, obviously the banks having very large um, um, fees and infrastructure in place. Uh, so we're telling the, the individuals, yes, you have to um, do your business online. But while you're doing on business online, we're not actually um, equal to, as, as you would say, um, the larger developed countries. So we're doing business online, but there's a significant uh, increase in the cost of, the, of doing that business online. Secondly is, of course, the access to it. So access, um, you know, they're trying to put in more and more uh, e-government um, type uh, initiatives, but we now need to talk about the, the same cost of access of that technology to the general population. Um, so we want them to utilize these services. We want them to, um, to be involved and to be moving along. Um, we want them to be learning online. We want them to be doing their commerce. Um, but we also now have to understand that this is the reality of, of, of on the ground, um, actually the individuals being able to, to afford access to, to a, a mobile network getting access to a laptop, getting access to a, a computer, getting access to a, a mobile phone to interface and actually, um, you know, utilize these services that are being made, made available. Uh, finally, 
I just wanted to, to bring up the, the uh, issue of the, the, the banked and the underbanked. Uh, uh, unbanked and underbanked. And, and really, th this is just talking about financial inclusion. But this financial inclusion is coming back to the same um, listing now of technology. So we want uh, at, at the same time now to, to say that we have a large portion uh, of the population um, because of our culture who do not have access to these financial services. Um, and these financial services, of course, again, are moving down the line of being more and more digitized. So we're moving into more and more digital currency, and we're moving more and more into um, you know, trade, again, in a, uh, using an online environment. Unfortunately, we're not moving along significant portions of the population at the same time. So these are just kind of um, highlighting some of the challenges that we see um, on the ground in civil society. Um, so we, we look forward uh, to uh, giving our input, of course, um, uh, having an impact uh, and having our voice heard at that UNCTAD level um, to see that, that these policies, when they now get implemented, um, actually make a difference in the lives of people um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you uh, so much for those contributions, uh, Julian. So I am, um, I, I understand that there are some uh, questions coming up in the Slido. Uh, I understand that UNCTAD was supposed to be sending those to me. I don't actually uh, see them yet, but I do see um, a discussion question here. Uh, thank you to CPDC for, for sending that along. The first discussion question I'd like to ask is, um, UNCTAD should step up its role in driving digital transformation in the global south, and how can UNCTAD help democratize the use of governance and data? I wonder if anyone would like to jump in and answer that question. Should I, Debra? Go ahead, Parminder, you have the floor. Thanks, Debra. Uh, that's an excellent question because uh, the whole paraphernalia, I mean, not the whole superstructure of digital economy is built around this data over top of which is AI and then everything else. So, so thanks for a very good question. Uh, you're talking about democratizing the governance of data. Now, everybody know it's pretty simple if you almost follow uh, a, a logical uh, uh, you know, sequence of uh, uh, arguments. Uh, a governance, we all know, everybody talks about data being an economic resource. I mean, everybody talks about it, the new libs, World Bank, everyone. Now, if you are talking about a governance of an economic resource, what is fundamental to the governance of economic resource? The first thing is uh, ownership of that resource. Who owns that resource is the starting point of governance of any economic resource. That's very fundamental. Nobody can deny this fundamental fact. Now, where is the framework of ownership of uh, uh, data? And you may say there is no framework, and actually there are default frameworks. It's like politics abhors uh, vacuum, governance also about vacuum. When you keep on hearing this language of free flow of data, that's a certain framework of ownership of data. What it really is saying uh, when they say free flow of data is that whoever collects data owns it. That's what it means that if I'm collecting the data, allow the data to come to me. Uh, don't stop it. Uh, and the default then is that whoever collects the data owns it. And that's the default all over the world. And that defines the dominant model of digital economy. Who, who could otherwise own the data? And you're talking about democratizing it. There are only two parties to data, one who collects and one who, uh, one who produces or is the subject of data. Now, if we come to the subject of data or one who produces the data to own the data, that would start democratizing uh, data uh, governance. I must add to add, to it add that everybody seems to be agreeable to say, okay, the individuals can own data because but the problem is twofold. An individual is hardly in any position to talk anything about his or her ownership of data. And we all take the, uh, you know, the, the squares as we all know. So it doesn't mean anything. And second part is most of the data, which is valuable data is patterns in the data, which cannot be individualized. It's a group data. And therefore the moment we start talking about collective ownership of data or community owner, shape of data and I can't go beyond it, but Indian government is actually now a kind of a policy or a document or a report 
on collective ownership of data. And the moment you start talking about individual and collective ownership of data, you start building an architecture of governance of data and you start democratizing uh, data. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'd like next to call on Ambassador Silva. Please, you have the floor. Yes, uh, I think uh, my um, question, uh, what uh, I like to force is to Adam, because he comes from an area where uh, the diversity in fishing activities um, are quite prominent, uh, because they have large scale, like Australia, and, and who are very active in and trying to uh, bring, um, you know, very, uh, how do I say, very, um, uh, progressive, uh, uh, you know, proposals um, for uh, for disciplining uh, subsidies, fishery subsidies, and also there are countries within the bloc uh, who are actually pursuing uh, to be um, be small time uh, players, um, and therefore they like the SNDT provisions to be more robust and particularly to exclude the the, the small scale fishery sector. Uh, now. What is your perspective of uh, the the way the most appropriate way for developing countries to really discipline this uh, distant water fishing or the the polluters in the world, rather than um, targeting, uh, you know, the, having disciplines to target everyone? So what they say is everybody should be making a contribution, like in the agriculture. So. I think we have learned many bitter lessons during the Uruguay round, and we don't. We are quite matured now. Of how many years? Uh, I think we are matured. So um, I'm not talking about my age, but developing countries uh, after learning bitter lessons during the Uruguay round in negotiating an imbalance agreement of agreement in agriculture. They don't nearly don't want another imbalance agreement uh, in the fishery subsidy sector. So what do you think the best approach for us to? from a practitioner's point of view, having more um, association with, uh, with the diversity of fishing sectors, what do you suggest? How do we tackle with this um, distortive nature of the fishing subsidies uh, prevalent uh, at the, in the present context? Thank you. Thank you. And we'll turn now to Adam to uh, respond. Um, thank you, Ambassador, for that question. And it, it is a very big challenge, I think, within these talks. Um, Pang, you know, for, for quite a number of years, has, has argued that the fisheries negotiations have to uphold the existing sovereignty that members already have under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which ex which explicitly says that they have the sovereign right and the responsibility to exploit and conserve the resources within their exclusive economic zone. And you know, that, that's a position that we've argued because A, we don't want to see the WTO undermining the sovereignty of, of nations and undermining other international treaties. Um, we also argue that to, you know, by upholding UNCLOS, it gives those, um, those countries the power and the authority to actually you know, continue to manage their resources. So to, for the Pacific, uh, and I will speak from the experience that Pang has had has in the Pacific, uh, the Pacific has a lot of experience very successfully managing its resources. Its tuna um, management conservation schemes are you know, considered world-class. But what we've seen is a consistent challenge to those management systems from Europe, from Australia and New Zealand. They despite having the sustainability pedigree of these systems, that is not the interest in, from, from these you know, distant water fishing nations. They want to have access to their resources. And our fear is that these talks give them another platform to challenge those measure, management measures. Yeah. Now, the, your, your question is how do we target those, those, those big industrial subsizes? Is this, you know, does everyone have a responsibility within these negotiations? And, and the answer is yes and no. It's yes in, in the way that um, I think the approach to other environmental challenges like climate change has been around common but differentiated responsibility. It's not the Pacific that has decimated global fish stocks. It's not Africa. It's the Europeans. It's those who have 
sub so heavily subsidized and built such capacity that has put us in the situation they're in. And they have to take the responsibility. They have to acknowledge their their role in the situation we face. And that's where the conversation starts. And these these enormous permanent carve outs that have been given to these subsidizers, it, it it's it's baffling that that is even acceptable. You know, even from these countries who are heavy proponents for an agreement and, and they're heavy proponents for an agreement because they're carved out. They don't, they take <laughs> very little responsibility within this outcome as it's currently standing. And, and that's the problem. And, you know, as civil society, we need to hold them to account. We know, you know, we need to say any agreement isn't a win. It has to target those who are responsible and it has to, this isn't just sustainability. This is, it has to be development as well. And it is completely unfair to say to Pacific Island countries, you can't build a domestic fishing fleet within your, to fish your waters, even though you sustainably manage them. You, we don't want you to do that. That is not the responsibility and the burden of developing countries um, to take that on, and especially fishing within their own waters. Um, so, yeah, so I think that's the approach. We need to uphold those sovereign rights that countries already have and target specifically those countries who have created this historical situation that we're in. Thank you so much, Adam. Very uh, excellent and uh, illuminating answer. I'm going to go to another question that we have, uh, which is, um, how can we circumvent WTO's rules and set up a more enabling preferential treatment of developing countries in order to better integrate them into the global economy? And I really like this question because many of you may not be aware of the fact that UNCTAD uh, as an institution actually predates the WTO by several decades. And it was actually invented in a recognition of the fact that developing countries face structural barriers within developed countries to using trade for their development. So it's not just that the trade system is fine and developing countries haven't figured out how to use it yet. It's that there are structural barriers to developing countries being able to use trade for their development. And so UNCTAD, one of its first uh, initiatives was to come up with a generalized system of preferences. And this is a, a concrete recognition of the fact that there are differences in developing countries and developed countries, but not just because developing countries don't know how to benefit, uh, but because of the structural barriers in the way that developed countries has created the, um, the system. So. Uh, I think I want to turn uh, to Sonia uh, to uh, answer that question. And I also am recognizing of the fact that we have approximately 15, 16, 17, 18 minutes. Um, I'm going to give uh, five minutes to Sandra Masaya, who is a representative of PSI from the Caribbean, uh, to speak also. Uh, and I'd like to see if any other of the um, panelists have any closing remarks they'd make. Um, so please go ahead, Sonia. Uh, thank you for that good question. So um, the question of how to circumvent WTO rules. So firstly, there's 164 countries in the WTO already, including many developing countries and least developed countries. And there are another 23 in the process of joining the WTO, which also includes developing countries and LDCs, for example, from Africa and Asia. So those who are already in the WTO have to comply with all the existing WTO rules that apply to all the countries in the WTO. Otherwise, they could be sued by another other government at the WTO and then if they lose in that dispute settlement process um, all the way to the end which is not quite functioning at the moment um, then there could be tariffs imposed on their exports until they change their laws to comply so the WTO rules are normally very enforceable in addition, as you heard um, from the other speakers, there are current negotiations at the WTO involving all the WTO members, for example, um, about how to restrict fisheries subsidies, where as you heard from Adam, not, there are not sufficient exceptions or special and differential treatment being given to developing countries and LDCs. So one way to ensure that they have sufficient policy space is to make sure that any such um, restrictions on giving fisheries subsidies um, have sufficient exceptions for LDCs in developing countries that are not limited by time, not limited by some small distance or small boats, so that they are able to um, develop their fisheries industries and so on. Then, of course, um, in addition to the GSP that uh, Deborah mentioned, developed countries are not agreeing to sufficient preferential um, treatment for, for example, least developed countries. Um, the um, 
extension or renewal of the um, transition period for intellectual property rules for least developed countries, which is supposed to be agreed um, as a mere formality. They have a right to it under the WTO rules, was hard fought and the LDCs didn't get it for as long as they wanted, which was until they graduate. Um, and the developed countries are not giving enough market access through the LDC services waiver in sectors of interest to least developed countries or modes like exporting their workers. And then uh, the least developed countries have also proposed that when they graduate, they can still have a transition period, for example, for another 12 years um, to enable a smooth transition before they have to implement things like intellectual property rules and other rules. But the developed countries have not agreed to that either. So then in addition in the WTO, um, in addition to these rules that apply across the board, without a legal mandate, some plurilateral negotiations have started. And you heard some of the other speakers mention the implications of the e-commerce uh, plurilateral negotiations. So that would further restrict policy space um, and make it harder for developing countries to better integrate into the global economy and develop, um, for example, digital industrialization, as Parminder mentioned. So. Um, that, that's supposed to be voluntary, who joins those plurilateral negotiations, uh, which are, have no legal mandate. But of course, we know from past WTO accessions that those 23 who are in the process of joining the WTO at the moment, including least developed countries, are likely to be required to join these so-called optional plurilaterals um, as a condition of getting into the WTO, even though these plurilaterals have no legal mandate under the WTO rules. Unlike say the special and differential treatment proposals by developing countries and LDCs, which have a mandate, but the developed countries are not agreeing to it. So that again, further restricts their ability to develop and integrate into the global economy. Then outside the WTO, um, there are free trade agreement negotiations going on um, and countries contemplating joining free trade agreements like the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership or RCEP um, and bilateral investment treaties which further restrict policy space um, for developing countries and LDCs to enable them to take the policies they need um, to industrialize, to have greater supply capacity and so on. And then in addition, since we're here at an UNCTAD forum, what is the role of UNCTAD? Um, and so I was concerned to see, for example, that some parts of UNCTAD are suggesting that um, developing countries and LDCs restrict their policy space, even when they are not required to by WTO rules. So for example, some of the E-Trade readiness assessments um, done by UNCTAD, for example, for Tanzania, said that they should consider establishing a de minimis value of up to 100 US dollars. So that would mean if Tanzania agreed to that suggestion, that Tanzania could not collect tariffs on anything that costs less than 100 US dollars when it ends in Tanzania, and maybe not even collect domestic taxes like value added tax. So all those imports come in tariff free and maybe other tax free, which would mean that Tanzania as a least developed country would lose significant tariff revenue. And as we heard from uh, the study, which has been posted in the Slido. So for those of you watching, um, there's a Slido you can click on the button and you, where you can see questions and answers. And since we couldn't post the links to the studies we've been mentioning in the chat, we have been posting them in Slido. So the study I mentioned on RCEP, for example, that says when developing countries and LDCs cut their tariffs, they can't make that revenue back from other sources. We put that link in the Slido um, and also to some of the studies mentioned by other speakers. Um, so if Tanzania can't make that revenue back, that's a permanent revenue loss that doesn't seem to have been considered in the UNCTAD E-Trade Readiness Study. And it also means that all those imports come in tariff free, which would then compete with Tanzanian farmers, for example, if they're dairy farmers, competing with skim milk powder coming in, um, $99 worth of skim milk powder coming in tariff free, and you can cut up all the shipments to come in each one under $100. And the same for manufactured products, whether it's clothing or anything else. So even at the WTO, in the plurilateral e-commerce negotiations, they are not proposing this, it's too extreme. And Tanzania is not even participating in those plurilateral negotiations. And yet the UNCTAD E-Trade Readiness says they should do even more than even in the WTO plurilaterals, there are proposals, even though Tanzania is not even participating in those negotiations. So even if, they, if countries like Tanzania avoid agreeing to these things in the WTO, some uh, staff in UNCTAD are asking them to agree to it and in ways that would restrict their policy space, their revenue, and their ability to uh, industrialize or have agriculture and food security and so on um, through UNCTAD's recommendations. So we find that very concerning. Thanks. Uh, excellent, thank you so much uh, for that uh, very comprehensive and, and on point response to that question. 
Um, we just have a few minutes left. So uh, what I'm going to do now is go to the speakers who um, who haven't spoken a second time yet and give them a chance to uh, make a concluding remark or two. Uh, and then we are uh, very lucky to have uh, Sandra Messiah uh, from Barbados who will be um, making some closing remarks for us. Uh, so if I can go to, uh, I will go to uh, Sophia and then Jane and then uh, Susana. Uh, so if you'd uh, be able to just make any remarks about the questions that have come up or other speakers panels or anything, uh, we just have uh, a minute or two each. Um, so Sophia, you have the floor. Thank you, Deborah. Yeah, I just wanted to, to say that there was a, throughout the, this panel, there was a lot of information about what things we should take care of, what ch things sh should be changed in the, in the trade system, and how UNCTAD can help us build a better trade agenda that is sustainable, but also that solves all the inequalities that we have faced so far in the actual, uh, in, the, in the, the current trade system that we have now. And what I think is that we cannot lo lose this opportunity in the, in the midst of the digital industrialization to get the, in the, the new trade rules right, because there's so much inequality already in the world and there's so much poverty already in the world. And all that is caused mainly because our trade rules have been unfair to developing countries and because there's a lot of inequalities in the trade system that need to be solved now. So we cannot just sit around and ask countries to just uh, um, uh, to just adjust to the current system. We need to change the system. And for that to happen, we need UNCTAD because we need serious research about the real impacts of the, of the digitalization and the trade system around the world. We don't need just... Um, nice wording that looks uh, nice but in the in in the in the real meaning of the wording it means that countries cannot do anything and they just put handcuffs on what they can really do and the policies that they can implement inside the countries we need countries to have policy space and we need an UNCTAD to give numbers to support that poli those policies and to get those policies right so that's my concluding remark, we need UNCTAD, and for that to happen, we need an UNCTAD that really focuses on uh, giving resources to the countries so they can really build capacity inside their own countries to get the digitalization right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sophia. And I see you've actually uh, addressed uh, this other question that came up about whether or not UNCTAD still has a valid role as a global governance institution. I think you've just answered that in terms of the capacity building and consensus building and research that uh, developing countries actually need uh, to promote growth and development. So that is very helpful. Uh, Jane Nalunga, uh, would you like to make any closing remarks? You have the floor. Thank you so much, Deborah, and thanks to, to all the panelists. It has been really great. I also concur with the previous speakers that we still need ACTAD. We need it like yesterday. Uh, we need ACTAD to help us uh, navigate the many, many parallel trade negotiations going on. Uh, I see in my region, uh, we have so many, we have the CFTA, the Continental Free Trade Area. We are negotiating now in the WTO. We have the DPA, EPAs. We have the FTAs, the US, UK. Then we have also to renegotiate our goa. You know, there are so many. And we need, we need research to back up our positions. And we need to be aware that sometimes what, when we fight on one front, sometimes we lose it on another front when we don't have any research. I can give you an example of the investment issue. We fought very hard in the WTO. We stopped the new issues in the WTO only to go back home and we are signing the BITs because we were told, our governments were told that when you sign BITs, then, you know, so, so we need to be able to navigate.
Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Jane. Uh, and our uh, last speaker, and I'm sorry, but we're really running short on time. Uh, Susana Barria, you have the floor. You're on mute. Thank you very much, Deborah. I'm also going to quickly speak to the question about the, uh, the UNCTAD's valued role as a global institution for development and maybe highlighting that um, the, the importance of UN, UN institutions as democratic organizations and the challenges that come from um, small minority groupings of powerful nations or of uh, multi-stakeholder forums um, that bring other powerful actors to have a driving seat and in the face of this challenge, the um, importance to reassert the legitimacy of UN organization um, by strengthening the capacity um, to um, speak truth and evidence to power from the perspective of the core mandate, in this case, the perspective of development um, and therefore the very core agenda of developing countries and making policy recommendations that flow from uh, this understanding of social and economic justice, sustainable development for a majority, and unfortunately that uh, this is mostly missing from the current mandate, and there is a lot of work that needs to be done to ensure that that perspective is put back front and center. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I just want to um, mention, and I'm about to pass this on to Sandra, that there is a letter um, signed by a number of organizations, and it is on the trade, investment, digitalization, climate, et cetera, issues in the UNCTAD mandate. And this um, link, I believe, has been posted in the Slido, but in case uh, you can also find it on our world is not for sale, excuse me, our world is not for sale.net. It is on the homepage on the far right under UNCTAD. Um, and that is a, a summary of addressing a lot of these issues. So you know, UNCTAD is going to occur in a key moment in the ongoing global uh, pandemic and recovery developing countries have suffered extensively, in large part because the international system's trade, investment, technology, and climate rules and practices have failed to provide an environment conducive to sustainable development. Developing countries will not be able to build back better unless the global community recognizes the need to transform the current trade rules. And we look forward to working with all of you to ensure that these provisions are included in the UNCTAD mandate. So as I'm um, ending my session as moderator, I'd like to thank our esteemed panelists. Uh, I think you see the strength and diversity of perspectives, regional experiences, sectoral experiences, issue concentrations. I hope it's been valuable, especially for those who are working on the UNCTAD mandate. So I'd like to thank all of our esteemed panelists and also to Ambassador Gautami Silva for joining us on this panel today. And I would definitely uh, love to thank our host, CSO, CPDC, the Caribbean Policy Development Center, and everyone at UNCTAD who worked to make sure of the success of this CSO forum. I hope you all will join for another panel on financing for development issues, which is coming up next. Uh, and with that, I thank you. And Sandra Masai, you have the floor to close the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deborah. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you all, and hello. Um, certainly, I want to add my voice in terms of offering thanks and appreciation on behalf of the International Civil Society Facilitation Group. I extend that thanks and appreciation to the CPDC, the Caribbean Policy Development Center, who's our local CSO forum here in Barbados, and of course to the UNCTAD and its various teams, both in Barbados and Geneva, and in fact, wherever you may also be throughout the world. It is by working together through collective action that we've been able to make this forum possible and together you have helped to make things happen. Thanks to you, Deborah, you set the background against which the team of panelists provided perspectives from the people. We're here to speak for the people. And I'm sure that you'll all agree that the points raised illuminate the myriad of issues that relate to trade, technology and development. Indeed, the panelists were able to project and inject a discourse that is people-centered, a discourse that focuses on the realities of people's lives. The various speakers have given glimpses into the lives of people across the world, from the SIDS in the Caribbean and the Pacific, to Asia and to Africa. 
In fact, their perspectives have highlighted that we live in an interconnected world. If I may, I'd like to refer to a grouping of uh, members within the public services and wider trade union movement that was hosted by the Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies last week. And in fact, these issues were also on the agenda and particularly they highlighted the TRIPS waiver and the overwhelming support from Caribbean trade unionists on the TRIPS waiver, the TRIPS waiver proposal, and the fact that we will continue to press CARICOM, recognizing of course that CARICOM was very much involved in supporting the proposal, but in a way fell short. They didn't co-sponsor that proposal. Secondly, the grouping also worked on identifying that the issue of digitalization, e-government, e-commerce was one in which Caribbean peoples needed to be more involved in. And we hope that through the trade union movement across the wider Caribbean, and we're not only talking about the English speaking Caribbean, that we will add our voices to it. Colleagues, thank you very much for your expertise. Thank you for your first-hand interventions in this panel. You've put the public interest front and center. You've highlighted the need for transformational policies that will promote genuine sustainable development for, gen for developing countries. Ambassador Gothami Silva, thank you for adding your voice to this panel's deliberations and perspectives. Your comments on the current draft of the mandate are well noted and welcome. We appreciate and are inspired by your efforts to include and give volume to the voices of those of us in civil society, wherever we are. To you, participants, thank you for your engagement with the panel. Please stay with us for the next panel, which is our third plenary session, where we have six more knowledgeable and accomplished colleagues and partners. They will discuss systemic reforms, for fiscal space. It will be an interesting panel. Stay with us. Thank you. It's funny, little tragedies in here now. <laughs> well, you're, well, I can show some more Macaw trees in here then. Yeah. Yeah, right, so then you're coming through there. What is a bread fruit? No, I cut this, yeah, I cut this. But you can hold it to as a, as a, as a, a steer. A yeah. And then, so from right here, right? See this here? We can clear this branch here. Because when you come here and you look up, there's a cathedral. Okay. Look at these palms. At least 100 feet in the air. Real beautiful, yeah, real thing. So this is the cathedral right here. Cocoa Hills is actually the name of the project now. And the idea behind Cocoa Hills really and truly is to plant all the tropical fruit trees that I can find concentrated on, on some main crops like cocoa, coffee, coconuts. It was always my ambition, idea to, to plant coconut trees in Barbados from a long time ago. Uh, look, 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 that one there got coconuts too. Yeah. I did a lot of research reading history of Barbados and some older documents um, and what we used to grow here. And so what I'm trying to do is replicate that to find old stock like cocoa trees, pineapples, mammy apples, soursop, different kinds of bananas, different kinds of coconuts. Um, either buy them from the government nursery or private nurseries or collecting them from cuttings, seedlings, etc. Bring them here in the nursery, um, grow them up and then plant them out in the forest. One of the things that we are trying to do with this project too is value added or what they will call agricultural entrepreneurship in that it is not only agriculture, but it's looking at the value-added processes of agriculture. So, so, for instance, we make our own chocolates. And so we are growing cocoa trees here. But the ganaches or the fillings for the chocolates, like uh, bay leaf or mint or lemongrass or ginger, we also grow here. So not only is this an agricultural project, but in a way it's a narrative, it's a story. 
It's about taking things and adding value to the process. I used to be a filmmaker and I like to, you know, write stories and all of that. But in a way, I know that when I plant a coconut tree, I'll get coconuts. So if I plant a plum tree, I'm going to get plums. I can see the fruit of my work in front of my own eyes. I can see the fruit growing up and I can pick it. Got to touch to make sure it's real, like it's happening. But amazing, man. Look, I'm, I'm very... It, proud might be the word, I don't know, but happy, gracious, grateful. Again, two breeds of pineapples growing here. Look at this one here. Right, I think it's called Antigua Black. And I have another one growing here. I don't know what breed this is, but I got it from a... I got it from a Dutch guy. And they really seem to like the soil. One of the other things too then would be an, um, an, an experiment in terms of land conservation, forest restoration, um, to look at saving the Scotland district in a very creative way. The Scotland district represents 17% of our land mass and a lot of it is being abandoned or is being deemed as unusable. This project looks to speak to change that idea. These are the old tank garden beds, apparently from about 1930s, I think when it was abandoned. You can see the furrow right here, there's the bed. There's another furrow here. There's the bed. There's the furrow. That's the bed. The problem with this is that they were all done downhill. So this is where the erosion happened. Water come down through the furrows, create little water courses, and over a long, long time, create erosion issues. These are old casuina trees that are rotten, fall down. And what we're gonna do is cut them up and put them on the contours and make some terraces. So this is a terrace here. You can see it's already starting to form leaves accumulating in it, soil will come down in there, and this is going to become a planting edge. Well, we got to work smart, man, you know? I'm also involved in the hotel industry, the tourism industry, and a lot of guests would be coming and asking me, like, hey, where is the, the, the local fruits? Uh, why we don't see, you know, uh, like mommy apples or plums or golden apples on the, on the breakfast menu or whatever. And I always would be holding my head down and saying, well, we import everything. And I think that's one of the impetus or the triggers that said, okay, you know what? I have to start in my own little way to try and grow the fruits that we can grow here um, to kind of fix this situation about food security. So see like this, this small bush here, mm -hmm. we, can, we can take this out, replace it with a coffee tree. Take that out, replace it with a coffee tree. Take it out, replace it with a coffee tree. This little bush here, he's seeing size as a, as a cocoa tree. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. This here so, same thing. I don't know, what this is? This is what? All right, good. So that could become a cocoa tree there. Yeah. So in other words, you can still look natural, and you can still look wild, but you're going to got cocoa and coffee in this area here. Mm. Yeah. You don't eat this though, right? Mm -hmm. This is this is like bong your throat and thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. But again, if you like replace it and put taro or something, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Dig holes, put in trees. Yeah, dig holes, put in trees. Yeah. Right. But here, so no. If you come a little bit here and clear up, mm -hmm. just like a view saw, correct. Yeah, leave them trees, that's all right. But here, just here. Open that there. Open that here, you can look down the valley. The long-term plan of this project is really to become a repository of tropical fruit trees, herbs, and spices. It will become a resource for people who are interested or to, to, to see these fruit trees or to taste them or whatever, or to work with them. 
And, oh, yeah, you know, to make it beautiful too, obviously, to make it into a beautiful garden, forest that you could walk and, and, and see all of these, uh, see nature without spoiling or um, altering the forest too much. Hello to all of you delegates and officials participating in the Civil Society Forum over the next few days. My name is Dr. Chantal Monroe Knight and I'm the Civil Society Forum Lead. I'm just so honored to be able to welcome you to the Civil Society Forum. We have a popular theme song that says, if you can't come to Barbados, we'll bring Barbados to you. So it's really a privilege for me to welcome you also to the warmth and sunshine of Barbados. So whether it's morning, afternoon, night, whether it's cold where you are, just imagine yourself in sunny Barbados. I want to acknowledge that indeed, it's been a difficult road. We've had to overcome some challenges as civil society to get to this point. But we are here because you have demonstrated your resilience and steadfastness to the cause. So I'm looking forward to two days of critical deliberations and discussions that are going to allow us to be able to showcase civil society at its very best. And even though we may be online, I'm also expecting that you are gonna be just as passionate about your cause as we are if we were meeting face to face. I've had the privilege of welcoming you first, but please, others will come after me as we seek to move this lever under the team from inequality and vulnerability to prosperity for all. Welcome. Greetings to all. My name is Queen Ashiba Trotman, and I am the chairperson of the Ichiruganem Council for the Advancement of Rastafari, Barbados. I am indeed pleased to be part of the welcome to you, the participants, and the organizers of this, the 15th session of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. Barbados is indeed a beautiful island. However, we suffer from unfair trade rules and high debts. Civil society is an important voice to organize and centralize developmental projects and also hold our governments accountable for assistance. ICAR Barbados, as a grassroots organization, has identified food security through agriculture as a very important project to enhance the growth of our community and the wider community. Our, organic, our eco organic farming cooperative will continue to provide food, job creation, and promote a healthy lifestyle, all the while protecting our environment and coastal habitat. As we say, let food be your medicine our medicine shall be your food. To our civil society partners across the globe, the sick must be cared for, the infants nourished, and the elderly protected, as we face some of the greatest challenges globally. I ask, please, that this meeting is not all talk, as the time for action is now. Let us be mindful of our theme from inequality and vulnerability to prosperity. To all of you, blessings and one love. We the citizens of small and developing states are in the midst of a crisis like no other. We face the shockwaves from the current global pandemic that threaten to undermine the social and economic fabric of our society which coincidentally is occurring at a time when climate change is threatening the physical land space and the existence of the ecosystems that support the lives and livelihoods of our Caribbean people. Untad 15 is an opportunity for everyone to simply and effectively weigh in their scope of knowledge. 
contribute to social economic policy research and analysis, as well as to create avenues for promoting meaningful global economic cooperation, particularly amongst developing countries that will redound to the benefit of all. Collaboration of this nature is the best path for us to achieve the target set out in the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. It is my hope that you will earnestly participate in UNTA 15 to ensure that this critical opportunity creates dynamic and innovative partnerships that will help to move us from inequality and vulnerability to prosperity for all. Help us to resilience. We the youth want to stay alive and strive. Welcome. Welcome everyone to this second panel on day two of the Civil Society Forum. I'm going to be your moderator for this particular plenary, for this particular session. My name is Chantal Monroe Knight. This session looks at systemic reforms for fiscal space. And it really follows so very nicely from the previous discussion that we've had. Thanks once again to um, Deborah James and all of the panelists making some really solid and fundamental points around trade development and technology and how we reframe the discourse. And again, this panel really follows nicely as we consider those issues around economic governance and ensuring that developing countries, southern countries, are able to have the necessary fiscal space, particularly in this environment that we are in. Um, clearly, the analysis is showing that in this environment, developing countries need a level of fiscal space that will allow them to deal with the many challenges, whether that is COVID, whether that is climate change. And it has been one of the critical issues confronting developing countries for some time, particularly in the context of WTO negotiations um, and the extent to which um, you know, these international spaces really work to constrain the space that developing countries have to be able to catch up and to move forward. We have a very, very esteemed panel um, that is joining us today to have this discussion. And I'm very happy um, to have all of them to look at some critical issues, um, like I said before, around this, issue, around this issue of systemic reforms for fiscal space. And you can expect in this discussion that we'll be looking at the global acceptance of vulnerability as a key um, trigger for accessing debt relief and concessional finance. Um, they'll also be looking at debt and human rights, debt sustainability and reform of the international financial architecture and governance systems. We'll explore the issues of achieving equity and transparency in international ta tax governance regulations. And also as well, how do we foster South-South cooperation by harnessing financial and investment opportunities between developing um, between developing countries. So as you see already, much, much that we will have to discuss in this, this, in this session. Um, before we get into those um, panelists, if you would just allow me a few minutes to just read their bios um, for you. So first up, we have Ambassador Khalil Has Hasmi. Ambassador Khalid Hasmi assumed his position as a permanent representative of Pakistan to the United Nations and other international organizations in Geneva on the 10th of November 2019. Prior to his appointment in Geneva, Ambassador Hasmi served as Director General, United Nations at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Ambassador Hasmi has previously held portfolios of Director General for European Region, Director General Arms Control and Director for Disarmament Affairs, India and South Asian region. I also then want to introduce Dr. Deheje um, Almayu, Dire 
Dwayne Almayu is the executive coordinator of the Global Alliance for Tax Justice, a global coalition for tax justice that was recently nominated to the Nobel Peace Prize. Prior to his um, participation in the Global Alliance for Tax Justice, the RAJ has served as the founding chair of the Tax Justice Network Africa 2008-2016, as well as a senior economic justice advisor at Christian Aid. He also worked as Christian Aid's country manager for East Africa for 15 years. Before joining the CSO sector, he worked as a lecturer at the Free University Berlin from 1987 to 1998. He holds an MA in Development Studies and a PhD in Economics from the same university. Professor Anne Shaudry. Shaudry joined the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, UN Desk in New York as a Senior Economic Affairs Officer in the Office of the Under Secretary General in October 2008. He was Director of Macroeconomic Policy and Development D Division and Director of Statistics Division of the Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, and is retired as Chief in the Finance and for Development Office on the 31st of January 20, 2016. He led the preparations of the ESCAP's flagship publications, Economic and Social Survey of Asia and the Pacific, and also as well the Statistical Yearbook of Asia and the Pacific, along with many other publications focused on social development challenges across the globe. I also want to introduce Mr. Christopher Sinclair. Mr. Christopher Sinclair, who just also happens to be with me um, in the studio this morning, is an international trade and development specialist with over 25 years of experience working in public, private, and civil society sectors in Barbados, the Caribbean and wider field. He is the former Minister of Finance and Economic Affairs of Barbados from 2010 to 2018, and previously served as well as the Minister of Social Care Constituency Empowerment, Urban and Rural Development, and Minister of Foreign Affairs, Foreign Trade, and International Business. As a senior minister in the government of Barbados, he is responsible. He was responsible for the coordination and implementation of government's economic and social development policy, having served as chairman of the cabinet subcommittees on both social policy and economic policy. He was also a leader of the government business in the Barbados House of Assembly. And previous to this, Mr. Sinclair served as the executive coordinator and senior program officer at the Caribbean Policy Development Center. I'm introducing now Ms. Liddy Napil. Liddy is an activist from the Philippines working on economic, environmental, social, and gender justice issues. She's the coordinator of Jubilee South, Asia's People's Movement on Debt and Development the coordinator of the Global Campaign on Demand Climate Justice, and member of the Coordinating Committee of the Global Alliance on Tax Justice. She also serves as the Vice President of the Freedom from Debt Coalition in the Philippines and convener of the Philippine Movement of Climate Justice. And our last um, panelist, but not least, um, Man and I'm so very sorry that I'm going to be just so bad um, in relation to the pronunciation of this last name, and please forgive me. Um, so I'm gonna, just going to ask the panelists um, when she comes on to also as well um, just say her name again so that everybody um, hears it properly um, as opposed to my very bad um, pronunciation. But I am going to introduce um, Ms. Madaskin, um, Yuran Tukar. Um, she served, started her work in human rights field since 2004 when she joined the Center for Human Rights and Development, an NGO as a program coordinator of the Community-Based Development Program. From 2015 to 2018, the strategic objectives of the Community-Based Development Program have been identified as A, to support community participation to claim and implement mm -hmm. um, their rights to development, B, to facilitate community cooperation and partnership with stakeholders, for poverty reduction and local development, and to undertake awareness campaign, campaigns for land rights, healthy environment, and human rights protection. She's worked extensively in human rights education and training, community development, empowerment, and mobilization for human rights, also human rights monitoring and protection of land rights and participation in local and national development policies, and establishing community-based organization and facilitating their sustainable functions. She has 17 years of work experience in human rights and development and in 2017 be began, became the executive director um, of this community-based development um, program. 
So as you can see, uh, a very um, well-rounded panel. And so far, we are really looking forward to a really um, in-depth discussion on this issue of systemic reform um, for fiscal space. And we're going to go right into the, the discussion. And I'm going to invite the very first speaker um, to make his presentation. Um, Ambassador Khalil, you have 12 minutes um, for your presentation. And Ambassador Khalil, just once again, is the United Nations representative, permanent representative of Pakistan. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon from Geneva. Uh, dear members of the civil society, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me begin by thanking the Caribbean Policy Development Center, Deborah James and Stefano Prato, for the opportunity to speak at this important platform. I'm also very pleased to join this timely discussion in the run-up to the Antart 15's ministerial conference. It's only a few days away now. Uh, yesterday, the new Secretary General of Antart, Ms. Rebecca Greenspan, emphasized in this forum the imperative of the voice of civil society organizations for Antar's work and aspirations. I could not agree with her more. Um, we see the civil society as an important partner. Uh, we share a long trajectory um, of shared objectives and common and, uh, close engagement. Uh, your advocacy and inputs are extremely valuable. They matter a great deal as we navigate questions of global economic governance, policies, programs, with respect to trade, development, finance, and what do they mean for people in the developing world? Ladies and gentlemen, the topic of this session, uh, systemic reforms for fiscal space, speaks directly to the core concerns of developing countries at this difficult juncture. Even before the pandemic, developing countries had little fiscal space to maneuver. Many face the crisis with their debt burdens already at record levels. The pandemic and its varied economic fallout have further squeezed their fiscal space, as is evident from the sharp decline in international trade, drop in foreign direct investments, lost tourism revenues, impediments in stemming the illicit financial flows, among others. The COVID pandemic has brought to light the difficulties our countries face when hit by such exogenous shocks. It has, the pandemic has also exposed the systemic weaknesses and gaps in international economic architecture, limiting the fiscal space. The urgency and necessity of systemic reform is therefore obvious. We must do everything possible not to repeat the missed opportunities for reform after the 2008 financial crisis. Now, before I speak to the issue of systemic reforms, let me illustrate some of the stark gaps in opportunities and capacities for developing countries in terms of resource mobilization. According to a recent report by the Institute of New Economic Thinking, developed countries spend on an average 9,836 US dollars per person to respond to the COVID pandemic in its early phases. By contrast, least developed countries could only afford 17 US dollars per person. So as we know, many of the reasons for this dramatic difference in resource mobilization are in fact systemic in nature. Our economies operate under severe balance of payment constraints, high and growing external debt vulnerabilities, and therefore also limited fiscal space. A common factor hindering our ability to respond to crises such as the COVID pandemic is therefore our limited access to international liquidity. Developing countries do not issue international reserve currencies and do not have easy access to these. Furthermore, what international reserves we can build up often have to be earmarked to service external debt obligations with even less left for vital imports, including, for example, COVID vaccines. Ladies and gentlemen, let me now turn to the reforms. From our vantage point, a reform is required in several areas, ranging from the international debt architecture to the international taxation system and the overall global financial and economic system. First, on the foreign debt issue, it is clear that some of the global 
policy measures taken by the IMF and G20. And I don't want to get into those details and naming those specific initiatives, which were aimed at addressing the debt burden of developing countries, have focused on time-bound liquidity, liquidity provision. These measures are arguably insufficient in scope and coverage. For instance, they do not cover the debt ridden and pandemic struck middle income countries. Other measures such as temporary debt servicing relief of official debt for low income countries are also far from sufficient given the nature and scope of challenge. Another problem is that the bulk of developing country debt is owed to the private sector creditors who have not even participated in international initiatives for temporary debt service relief. Even as some of these measures provide a measure of breathing space and are welcome, they do not in any way constitute systemic approaches to address the very serious problem of unsustainable debt and other burdens. At best, they are band-aid and ad hoc measures shy of addressing the structural issue of the reform of the international debt architecture. The recent new allocation of special drawing rights to the tune of uh, 650 billion US dollars provided a very, warm, a very welcome relief, even if only just over one third of this goes to 150 developing countries and only 9.2 billion US dollars to the poorest countries. This measure is even more important since other multilateral efforts to mitigate the impact of the COVID crisis on developing countries have been lackluster at best. As we know, COVAX, COVAX um, has just announced that it will cut its deliveries of vaccines to developing countries by 25% in 2021. And there has so far not been any substantive debt relief for crisis-stricken developing countries as a mentioned just earlier. Ladies and gentlemen, this, and I'll revert to some of the measures and how civil society can contribute in that effort. Let me now turn to the vital role of UNCTAD and of our current negotiations of the mandates for the next four years. It is often forgotten that UNCTAD played a vital role in the creation of special drawing rights in the 1960s and especially, and specifically, emphasized their importance for the financing of development. UNCTAD's then demand to link the creation of SDRs directly to the use, of, use for development finance purposes was eventually disregarded by advanced country member states of the IMF. But in the wake of the disastrous impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on developing countries, calls to ensure a more stringent allocation of SDRs to our economies have gained renewed attention as the most recent trade and development report points out. Similarly, UNCTAD has been at the forefront of calls to ensure a transparent, more effective and equitable international framework to address sovereign debt restructurings. Ever since sovereign debt crises became a fixture of many of our economies in the 1980s, UNCTAD has always kept abreast of new developments in the international financial and monetary system of relevance to developing countries, such as, for example, the growing constraint on our fiscal spaces arising from illicit financial flows. The list of analysis and policy proposals in these and related areas is long indeed and has been instrumental in providing developing countries with a stronger voice on needed reforms of the international monetary and financial system. It is not by coincidence that UNCTAD has a front seat in the IMF's Monetary and Financial Committee. This work is as essential now as it has been over the past almost six decades since UNCTAD was founded. If anything, and given the mounting challenges to multilateralism that have been discussed here earlier, it is perhaps more essential than ever. This is why core and core and long-standing mandates for UNCTAR to address shortcomings in the current international and financial system from a development point of view, to ensure affordable and effective development finance and thereby to help free up much needed fiscal space in our economies must remain a central element of the Bridgetown Covenant. 
we have made important progress in this regard and, and the unwavering support of civil society is both much welcome and much needed. Ladies and gentlemen, let me now turn to what and how the civil society can help in advancing a systemic reform agenda for fiscal space. Uh, first, I wish to draw attention to the civil society finance for development group submission to the UN independent expert on foreign debt and human rights. This submission, uh, which was titled International Debt Architecture Reform and Human Rights, was made in June 2021. And it proposed, and I quote, debt architecture reform agenda for real change and real solutions, unquote, to fill in the gaps in debt relief, debt restructuring, and liquidity provision. So this is something to further build on. Um, the civil society can also advocate for additional policy options on the table at various forums. For instance, the establishment of a multilateral framework for debt restructuring. Um, as we know, the, the devastating economic and social effects of the pandemic did raise initially a modicum of hope and debate, generated some debate towards reform of the international debt architecture. This proposition, however, continues to face headwinds. The lessons from this pandemic are clear. The reform of the global debt architecture is urgent and essential. The international community already has an agreed uh, international framework in the form of the UN General Assembly Resolution 95 slash 2015, calling for establishment of multilateral framework for sovereign debt restructuring. I would therefore commend the civil society organizations to lend their support for timely implementation of this resolution at all forums. The second is establishment of a global debt authority. As we know, Angtar has proposed establishment of this authority to stop a repeat liquidity crisis from turning into serial sovereign defaults. This proposal has many merits and needs serious consideration. To oppose this proposal would be tantamount to missing an opportunity of a century. Let's not waste the momentum created by the current crisis. If timely action is not taken, debt-driven developing countries face the real risk of losing a decade of development. I hope the civil society can lend its voice and support to this proposal also. Next is the creation of independent credit rating agency. The civil society can play an important role in calling for the reform of the credit rating agencies. And what we mean by that is specifically that <clears throat> their inclusion in the equation of international debt architecture is essential. Why? Because the way these credit agencies work, they affect the implementation of many of the proposed debt relief measures in terms of credit rating of various countries. Next is the creation of a multinational vulnerability criteria. So in our view, the lending criteria should not be focused on GDP per capita, but should be based on countries' urgency of its need for liquidity. This is another area where civil society can lend its support. Another area is the, that the IMF quota system needs to be further reformed, and by which we mean that there should be a standing mechanism to rechannel the unused SDRs to countries which need it. Finally, the civil society's voice and support is equally essential for addressing the issue of illicit financial flows and reform of the international taxation system. As we know, the illicit financial flows from tax abuse, cross-border corruption, and transnational financial crime, crime drain resources from use in advancing um, the sustainable development agenda with all the attendant consequences for accelerating in inequalities, instability, and erosion of public trust. <clears throat> the recent estimates by Angtar suggest that revenue losses caused by tax-motivated illicit financial flows alone are in the range of 49 to 193 billion US dollars. So illicit financial flows are a systemic problem requiring a systemic solution. A web of existing international instruments 
and institutions has grown organically over time, responding to a wide variety of interests in the fields of tax cooperation, anti-money laundering, and anti-corruption. Yet, they leave gaps around inclusion, implementation, and enforcement. There is no single body tasked with global coordination, allowing thereby incoherence and duplication. An entire ecosystem approach is needed to address the shortcomings of the present patchwork of structures and adapt them to ever evolving risks. The civil society organizations can lend their support uh, for the key recommendations of the FACTI panel, um, which was established by Norway and Nigerian president of the General Assembly. And they have put together a, a number of very useful recommendations to which the civil society can lend its support. I won't go into those recommendations. These active panel recommendations are, are available and are well known. So finally, on the international tax uh, taxation regime, according to recent estimates, global loss to governments from profit shifting by multinational enterprises is between 500 to $600 billion a year. So the, here again, civil society can help in promoting international tax norms, particularly tax transparency standards to be developed through an open and inclusive legal instrument with universal participation. To that end, the civil society organizations can advocate and lend their support to the proposal for a UN tax convention. And this brings me to the end of my remarks. Thank you so much for this opportunity again. Ambassador, can
and shaping up the policy space and to be able to hear from him some of the specific constraints um, that developing countries have as they intend to negotiate um, you know, within the particular frameworks of the WTO and the AMF and, how, and what is needed specifically um, for small and developing states to be able to best maneuver in this, um, in this environment. Yeah, um, and like I said before, we have um, Dr. Jereje Alumahu who will be coming up next. Um, Dr. Jereje, you will have 10 minutes for your presentation. And I'm just gonna ask all these speakers, please, um, if we could make sure that we stick to our time um, in relation to your, in relation to your presentations. Um, again, please stay with us um, as we move forward in the discussion on systemic reform for fiscal space, one of the key agenda items um, you know, in this UNCTAD 15 civil society, civil society forum um, as we explore the issues of how do we ensure that these international platforms and spaces allow for the necessary fiscal space for developing countries to be able to maneuver um, in this environment. Um, as well. Um, in particular, one of the pressing issues um, is this notion of having, um, yes, um, of looking at how we kind of um, achieve equity and transparency in international tax governance um, and regulation. And this is a good jump off point um, for us to um, introduce once again Dr. Jereje Alamahu. You have the floor, sir. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, uh, on this issue, I think uh, we, may, we may go a bit uh, back to 20, uh, 2015 uh, during the Financing for Development uh, Conference in Addis Ababa. As you may remember, uh, the, daily, the draft declaration was not agreed upon in in New York, where what usually happens when these conferences take place, the draft is already agreed upon, then the declaration is really not only an endorsement by higher officials and heads of state. But the negotiators did not agree to the draft statement, so they brought the draft with them to Addis. When the negotiations in Addis started, powerful OECD countries said, we will not negotiate this draft if one paragraph is not taken out of the draft negotiation. And that was the call of uh, G77 in China group for a UN tax body. They made it a precondition of agreeing to the other points, the removal of this, ar this article, uh, this paragraph from the draft negotiation do document. And as you may remember, the host country, Ethiopia, put uh, the G77 under pressure because they didn't want to see the negotiations fail. Uh, the G77 had to concede that paragraph was taken out. And at the declaration, uh, at the end of the statement, the G77 said, we have withdrawn it for now, but we'll continue uh, to, to struggle for a UN tax board in the future. Why was this blocked? That is the most important question. And it is related to the whole thing of marginalizing the UN and its, 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 its organizations as the centers at which the interest of developing countries are articulated and can be also expressed better. What were they saying? They were saying the OECD is doing tax, global tax, so it will be a duplication. But this is not about duplication. <clears throat> it is about giving preeminence pre to the interests of OECD member countries. As we are talking now, the, the OECD uh, has uh, behind closed doors and through a manipulative process uh, is pushing for a draft uh, tax agreement, uh, which is an endorsement of the the deal of the rich, which was agreed upon in, in uh, among the G7 uh, about two, two or three months ago. And developing countries are now being 
pressure to agree to this feature of the deal, which will, on one hand, will not solve any of the current problems, will not bring any more money or substantial revenue to, to these countries, and B, which leads to uh, locking them into an agreement which will be against their interest in the long run as well. Just it is it is good to remember when agreements are done, they have a locking character. The ones we are now fighting to 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 get rid of were done about a century ago, and they are still affecting us. So, <clears throat> and when you look at these negotiations behind closed doors, that, that is one of the things that is very surprising is individually developing countries, emerging country leaders, propose something else. And when, when it comes to the OECD process, they don't, you don't see any reflection, any consideration of these processes. So uh, we as Global Alliance are calling, uh, currently we are calling upon uh, civil society organizations worldwide to say no to this deal of the rich. Why are we doing this? For, for many reasons. One reason is we have not to surrender UN, the UN as an institution in which fair and inclusive processes lead to an agreement between sovereign nations. That is why the demand for bringing back that university, the reform of international tax issues to the UN is of paramount importance. It is always, you know, for OECD countries, they can do with or without the UN. If the UN is not, uh, if the UN is is not going to be the venue through which they can put across their interests, they have other other means of bringing their interests uh, to the agenda or to implement their interests. But for developing countries, there is no other institution or platform in which they can jointly push for their interest and the solutions they propose. This is a very important thing. So that is why we say no to behind the scene tax deals of the rich. Uh, and, and we call upon countries as well to make sure that this process take place in the UN in which the membership is universal, uh, the possibility of developing countries to join hands and articulate their interest together is also higher. In this context, it is very important also to look at uh, why this pressure on UNCTAD uh, to, to reduce the scope of its mandate, to reduce the issues with which uh, it, is, uh, it is grappling. It is, it is because UNCTAD is one of these, these uh, institutions in which up to now interests of developing countries have been articulated, forcefully presented. If you take an example around tax, there was a huge effort on part of rich countries to reduce the significance and the role of tax avoidance in the whole uh, tax abuse process, to reduce the, uh, the illicit financial flows only to outright tax evasion and to, to the famous corruption of developing country elites. It was, among others, the push that the uh, UNCTAD, uh, the, work, the hard work UNCTAD put, it put into this to defend some of, to defend some of the, uh, the, the SDG goals itself in terms of inclusive financial framework and to, to include business-induced illicit financial flows in the whole problematic of illicit financial flows. Uh, <coughs> So now what, what the, problem is, the, the problem I see is and why it is important for us to stand together with ANCTA to see to it that its mandate is not reduced is simply because it is in this vein that the pressure is being put. As I said, there is a strong push to eliminate the UN as the central institution in which global problems are addressed. And to our disappointment, sometimes even the, within the UN system, some would agree to it. In fact, outsource some of the activities that which is within their mandate, and contribute tacitly to the weakening of the UN system. 
So at this crucial time, uh, if you look at the, the reform proposed by uh, the OECD, which is now being under discussion, not only <clears throat> the first is it excludes the majority of multinational companies from the scope of the reform. According to certain figures, only 78 multinational companies will be reached by this, by this, uh, by this reform. The second one is it has set the minimum tax at 50, uh, minimum corporate income tax at 15 percent, which would mean, which is much lower than the average corporate income tax developing countries. This will result in the race to the minimum by most of developing countries. They will not have the muscle to resist and, and still uh, expect multinationals to pay uh, the 25 or 30 percent which have in their statutory tax rates when this minimum tax is bulldozed uh, along, along the world. And then uh, the, the amount of tax uh, which is not untaxed elsewhere, is also very minimal. But even the small gain from uh, uh, from the saved, uh, from the gain, gainable tax resources will go to the source countries or to home countries of the multinational companies. This means this, this draft agreement will further uh, deny developing countries their right, their sovereign right to tax the profits generated in their economies. So all in all, it is time for us to stand together and strengthen the role of the UN in, in, in setting global rules and standards, uh, which reflect also the interests of the majority of developing countries. The G77 should reorganize themselves and push for the for what they have been fighting for up to now. And for us, keeping the, the work on tax, on illicit financial flows, as, as a core mandate of the uh, UNCTAD is very important. Well, taking the UNCTAD out of this is again to bring back this discussion. We are only, corrupt, uh, uh, we are only interested in corruption and, and criminal uh, money laundering tax evasion uh, is criminal, but tax avoid, avoidance is legal. So the whole effort to take out ANCTAR from this role is part of the, the, the pushback to get us back to the corruption narrative and back to allowing multinationals to continue their tax abuses with impunity. So defending the ANCTAR mandate is part of the struggle to bring back the United Nations into its inherent role of being the institution in which intergovernmental processes come to, uh, bring about the solutions we are looking for. In the case of tax, it is about a UN based in, uh, intergovernmental negotiations to come up with a tax convention and uh, which, will, which will then set up a tax commission to, to, to come to, to the reform of international tax rules so that developing countries, not, it's not development then, it is about acknowledging, uh, recognizing and, and respecting the right of developing countries to tax the profits that are generated in their economies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Alimayu, for that presentation. Huh? Um, and again, lots for us to, to unpack um, in that in what you have said to us and, you know, particularly about making sure that the discussion and the debate comes back into the intergovernmental space um, as you see that we have this continuing um, move to take these discussions now into different spaces, yeah, um, in, outside of the intergovernmental space and your call for us to make sure as civil society that we continue to press for that strengthening of the UNCTAD mandate and therefore ensuring that the discussion and debates then returns then within the UN space. And I think that's a critical, critical message. Um, also, one of the things that stood out to me, again, you know, is, is that when you talked about the race to the minimum, and again, I hope that this is something that we can continue to impact as the discussion um, goes on. Um, I now want to invite Professor Chaudhry. Um, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Chantal. I need to present my PowerPoint, so you have to make me the host. Yeah, we've already made you the host. The... We've already made you the host that you can share. Okay. Can you see the PowerPoints? Yes, yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, thank you uh, for having me. And actually, uh, after uh, such an excellent presentation, uh, two presentations from me, uh, before me, by the Honorable Ambassador and Derej, uh, I am thinking actually to concentrate on, uh, on a different uh, aspects of fiscal space. Uh, that is, you now, if you look at the, uh, uh, what uh, we have, is the fiscal space, um, um, uh, there are four uh, uh, areas of fiscal space uh, that you get from the efficiency uh, uh, gains from uh, looking at the expenditure where there is subsidies or any uh, excesses, aid and debt relief, enough is uh, uh, been told, and domestic resource mobilization where you have the problem with with uh, illicit finance uh, uh, transfer, and you have the problem with uh, tax cooperation, and all these things are covered. What I'll, con uh, I'll concentrate is on borrowing, uh, uh, and uh, there are two types of borrowing. One is ex uh, external borrowing, and the second is a domestic borrowing. I will actually uh, concentrate on uh, domestic borrowing, because all these uh, discussions about uh, uh, your aid architecture, uh, debt relief architecture, debt uh, worker ar architecture, international tax cooperation, are a very lengthy process and very uncertain process. Uh, and, and we can't wait until, the, uh, until all these things are sorted out and uh, SDRs are sorted out, and, uh, IMF reforms are sorted out. So while you know, these are very important uh, aspects uh, and we need to survive and, um, and we need to look at the possibilities of, of borrowing domestically. Anyway, um, before that, I would just like to also uh, uh, take you through the fiscal space that are being used in the, in the literature, and I'm not going to go into the details of this. And this is this, you know, uh, more or less, it is a very static concept. Uh, it does not, the, the, the fiscal sustainability analysis that IMF does uh, and World Bank does, does not take into account of development. It is a very static, uh, short-term uh, uh, sustainability, which is basically uh, uh, look at the macroeconomic instability, uh, debt sustainability, I have you know, uh, highlighted, you, know, you have the debt sustainability uh, defined as, as solvency kind of thing. So it is a very narrow uh, definition it does not consider the growth impact. Uh, the growth does not the growth impact of government development and social expenditure. So viewed very narrowly, and macroeconomic stability is defined as uh, inflation rate, uh, preferably less than five percent for developing countries, and, and budget deficit cannot exceed three percent of GDP. Now I, the reason I'm saying this because this will have implication for domestic borrowing. Okay. And uh, is, uh, so I let me go back to that uh, slides where I talk about the domestic borrowing. Now, domestic borrowing, um, now quickly, uh, no, I, I'm not going to go through this. Uh, uh, as I said, uh, the Honorable um, Ambassador and, and uh, they, they, they uh, covered these issues uh, extensively. So I, it, I want to say actually one thing. The debt relief uh, that the G20's uh, DSSI is, 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 is a gimmick and, and paltry. And it's a, a kicking the can down the road. It's not a, actually debt relief. No, it is given a, a, a grace for uh, you know, the period in which you, 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 you pay your debt, but everything has to be paid with interest accumulating down the road. So it's not actually uh, doing anything uh, good. Uh, it, it actually will increase the debt burden down the road. So this, this is really dangerous. The, and our developing countries who are applying for this should be aware of the, what they're applying for, okay? The second thing, the, here I would like to emphasize the point that uh, the Honorable Ambassador made 
that the private sector did not participate. Uh, uh, you, know, uh, you see, the, now this, this actually you know, uh, exposes the, the, the hypocrisy around the, the, the concept of blended finance and, and, and PPPs in some way, uh, the billions of dollars uh, of aid can be leveraged to create trillions of dollars. No, we have heard this in the Addis Ababa conference, B2T. Uh, the, the private sector, no, uh, they, they, the borrowing from the private market is always higher, you know, developing countries always pay premium for higher risk. So they have made a lot of money. But when it comes to crisis, they don't want to take any risk. So they, get, they, got, they, they are creaming from all ends. So they, are, they can never be treated as, as a true partner for sustainable development. They are there to cream. And unfortunately, UN is now partnering with World Economic Forum to do its uh, 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 so-called food summit. So this is actually basically promoting business for profit. And we can see how the private sector is behaving when it comes to even vaccine, sharing the vaccine knowledge. So, and the other thing is, that the World Bank refuses to give debt relief, uh, uh, even though they believe the debt relief is important, they're not uh, willing to follow the IMF's uh, uh, example of debt relief, even, even if it is only for the developing uh, uh, low-income countries, it is, it is a real debt, debt relief and an innovative way of giving debt relief. So IMF, in this case, should be congratulated at least. Now, the domestic resource mobilization, uh, as I said, the tax issue, I'm not going to go into details, but I want to actually uh, um, uh, debunk some of the, uh, some of the uh, uh, myths around this. So the, 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 you know, the supply side economics, if your tax to GDP ratio rises, the G, the, your growth rate declines. This is for the developing countries. There's no, you cannot see any negative relationship between the tax to GDP ratio and the growth rate. And this is for the, sorry, this is the developing country, this is developed country. So uh, the tax to GDP ratio can go up, up to even 25%. Even, even, even uh, the growth will not be affected uh, significantly. Uh, so, um, the, but as I said, this debt uh, for the developing countries, uh, raising the tax to GDP ratio is limited the possibility because you know you have uh, large inf informal sectors. Your income level is low, so when income level is low, tax to GDP ratio has to be low. Uh, and historically, even the, the now developed countries had low tax to GDP ratio. And this, this uh, the proposed fifteen percent global minimum tax by G twenty five, sorry G twenty. Uh, is still dragging on uh, the uh, Northern Ireland, uh, sorry, Ireland is, uh, is still dragging the foot, uh, is, 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 is far low than what is needed, at least 25%. But anyways, it's step in the right direction. But what is important here, the distribution is favoring the rich countries. So again, the why is it is important for developing countries to be, as there is just said, to be at the table. They are uh, on the table, not at the table. What, what it means on the table means they are on the menu to be eaten up, to be devoured. So this is what is going on. So th that's why it's important to bring the discussions of tax reform, international tax cooperation to the UN uh, forum. Now, go, I'm going to the domestic uh, borrowing. As I said, this is really my main focus. I'm not going to the external borrowing. It's, 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 it's uh, all known. It's very limited scope we have, and we can't wait. But this is, even the domestic borrowing is constrained by new liberal means. One is macroeconomic instability. If you don't borrow domestically, deficit bad for growth, crowding out, recurring equivalence, all sorts of these. And by the way, the Cardian equivalence and crowding out are contradictory to each other. You cannot have both arguments in the same place. And inflation is bad for growth and, uh, and bad for poor. So I'll, I'll debunk each of these, and then I'll go into that. That causes microeconomic instability. This diagram I have taken from IMF 2010 fiscal monitor, May fiscal monitor. This was the uh, diagram used. This was the report uh, used to argue for premature uh, fiscal withdrawal and austerity uh, in, during the 
2008-2009 GFC financial crisis. You can see that this is the line that drew uh, the regression line, the red line. What is the positive relationship when the, the debt to GDP ratio increases? This is the macroeconomic instability. Uh, they have in, an index for that, and I see no relationship. Even when you, your debt to GDP ratio goes up to 120 percent, so and use these the, the no uh, regression results to argue for uh, uh, fiscal austerity. This is this is basically a genocide uh, they have done uh, in a way. So you uh, is is so dishonest this one, okay. And then they, they also do not differentiate between external debt and domestic debt. They all everything lumped together and then scared people, the, the, the policymakers away that you cannot even uh, borrow domestically. Uh, fiscal deficit is bad for growth. Now I have now plotted this myself, taking the average of fiscal deficit from 2000 to 2019, 147 countries. And you can see even the fiscal deficit goes up to 10 minus 10 percent. The growth is there is no relationship, and growth can be everything here. So why you know you scared the you know the the uh, in fact you know you can you can force actually a positive line here uh, when deficit goes up. The uh, depending on how you spend the deficit, the idea instead of making a very general statement, that is bad, deficit is bad, we should actually look at where that debt is being spent, where that deficit is being spent. There is no discussion in the that one. So let me look at these factors of new liberal, uh, uh, um, is, uh, factors of demand. This particular GD, debt GDP ratio, like 60%, IMF also uses 60% lags, sound basis. It's decided arbitrarily. It is the average debt to GDP ratio for some powerful country member countries at the time of Maastricht Treaty. Okay, and you, I have cited the literature and I have the references at the end of my uh, the, the, the presentation. People who are interested can look at the references. Similarly, 3% budget deficit rule was determined arbitrarily. There's no uh, this benchmark do not imply any optimality. There's no, there's no optimality implied. Even IMF itself, itself, uh, itself admitted 40% debt to GDP ratio. And this, this is only for the external debt. So it's not the domestic debt, not domestic debt, neither for, uh, okay. It emphasized that ratio above 40% GDP by no means implies a crisis. Indeed, there is, an 80% probability of not having a crisis, even when debt to GDP ratio exceeds 40%. So now I have quoted from the IMF. So this is the research that is being shown even within the IMF. But then when their operational people go to the countries, they are professing or prescribing policies driven by ideology, have no basis in their, even in their own empirical work. I have shown that. And then the 2012 World Economic Outlook uh, that, uh, that, I, uh, that the IMF publishes says no simple relationship between debt and growth, no single threshold for debt ratio that can delineate the bad from good. So this is what they're saying. And two decades ago, even the World Bank says there's a no unique set of thresholds for each macroeconomic variables between stability and instability. So why we are just stuck to some uh, arbitrary numbers as if they are from Bible or the Quran or something that you can't even touch that because this is so, so sacrosanct. And now the, the, the clouding of our business. It, it ignores that government is spending because the economy is in in recession or in the, they're not you know, aggregate demand is low. So when government is, does not spend by borrowing, the economy even will daily spin. When government spends, so what happens? Interest doesn't go up. When government spends by borrowing, 
how does government pay? Government pays to the suppliers, like you know, if I'm supplying something or I'm employed by government, credits my private bank, my account in the bank. So the, the central bank has a, has a has government account. The central bank credits uh, whatever uh, the government owes to me to my account. So what happens after that? The, the bank which holds my account, its liquidity goes up. Its, 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 its deposits goes up. When it happens, if the central bank does not raise uh, my, the bank's reserve requirements or does not do any counterbalancing act, the central, these private banks now will be creating its own credit, will make more loans. And, and so the interest rate rather goes down then goes up and the actually private borrowing goes up. So the, if you follow this pattern, what the crowding out is, 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 is actually emphasizing is the money supply that comes from the central bank. So as if government is actually competing for a fixed, fixed amount of money, but it ignores the credit that being created by the private banks as a consequence. Plus, then the second thing, when the government spends on, 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 in, uh, on, on productivity, on, on infrastructure, on education, that actually helps increase productivity, lowers the business cost, cost that should in fact crowd in the private investment. Then they claim recurring equivalence, meaning when government spends by borrowing, their debt level goes up. Today, tomorrow, government has to pay back this debt. So we, the private individual households are smart to understand that. So we start saving more because in the future we have to pay more tax. So as a result, if government uh, borrows $1 to spend, there will be $1 less spending by the private sector. So it will be 100% neutralizing. If that happens, then how does the carving out happen? Because there's no excess demand. So you cannot argue, use the, these two arguments together, but unfortunately, we do not see when the new liberals are using both argu contradictory arguments. So head, we take, head uh, we, I win, tail I win, <laughs> tail you lose. So <laughs> this is the situation. You can't um, uh, go on like this. Now, then government borrowing uh, uh, and spending raise inflation. That's the truth. Now, we have seen how much the, the, the central banks are spending after the 2008 GS, GF, GFC, the so-called uh, unconventional monetary policy. Inflation did not rise. Now, even during the, the pandemic, more than $16 trillion has been injected into the economy. And we don't see surge in inflation. The current spike in inflation that people are complaining is in a majority. 17 Nobel laureates signed an, a, 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 an open letter yesterday saying that this spike in inflation is temporary caused by supply bottlenecks and rise in commodity prices, nothing to do with the government. And even if inflation rises, what is our priority? People's life? jobs, livelihood, or giving advantage to the people who are creditors. It basically inflation will reduce the real value of the creditors. So we are basically beholden by the financial sector. Inflation hurts uh, growth and, and, and poor. Look at this. This is the the plot of average inflation between 2000 to 2019, 20 years of inflation, 174 countries, including Gaza and West Bank. Inflation can even go up to, you can see there is virtually anything can happen to, to, to uh, growth uh, in, in the inflation. And then you can see even even beyond 20% inflation, the growth is not affected negatively only after 50% we will start growing. Now, inflation 
accelerating beyond this level, 20%, is very rare in the history. Very, very rare. Only you can count a few episodes. And those episodes are linked to major breakdown, like you had Asian financial crisis, GFC, and a very transitory part. Also like Iranian revolution, uh, Sandinista uh, 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 revolution in, in Nicaragua happened. Uh, and after the first, the first World War, it happened in Germany. After the breakdown of the Soviet Union, it happened in, in the transition economy. So it is a complete breakdown of the system. And so to scare the countries in the normal time, that inflation somehow, if you let inflation uh, exceed uh, two to three percent, somehow it will it will be uncontrollable. Now. Bruno and Stelli. Bruno was the chief economist of, of the World Bank, and Stelli was a senior economist working within the World, World Bank at that time. They did an extensive, extensive study of between inflation and growth. And they asked the question, is inflation harmful to growth? And this is their answer. The ratio of urban belief to tangible evidence seems unusually high. So the, this is entirely driven by some kind of belief. Now, who are saying this? Horses not. Not us. And even when you have some threshold, threshold is not a sharp cliff that you somehow hit it and you will fall into the ditch. It is more like a plateau. You can experiment how much you can go. And by creating inflation, you create fiscal space because inflation helps fiscal space. And this last one is a central bank needs independence. So why? Because if you don't have the central bank independence, somehow inflation will be uncontrollable. Now, Milton Friedman, who is the, <laughs> who is the what shall I say, grandfather, godfather, or father of the new liberals, look at what he says. Money is too important to be left to the central bankers. For how many decades? Six decades ago, he said that money is too important to be left to the central bankers. Please, our CSO friends, uh, keep that in. And he has other objections. Political objections are perhaps more obvious than the economic one. Is it really tolerable in a democracy to have so much power concentrated in a body free of any direct political control? An economic argument is there. And I'm not going to the details. As I said, my slides will be available. You can look at that. Okay. So what is needed? Professor Shaudi, sorry, Professor Shaudi. So, I mean, presentation is really, really important. Um, but just in terms of time, can I just give you at least one minute or so just to kind of wrap up? Um, and then don't forget, we have a section for discussion and question and answers that we can allow you to yes. come back in. Thank yeah. you very much. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually nearly finished. I went to the... So we have to revisit the fiscal rules and all these limits that are fettering us. And, uh, and of course, we have to guard against fiscal abuse uh, the, and, and we need to have an uh, alternative democratic uh, oversight. That's why the CSOs are very important role they can play and, uh, and so on. So I have this, uh, the, the central bank uh, uh, governing board should have representative from the wider community that includes uh, the CSOs, and and so it has to be uh, there. There has to be democratic oversight on both fiscal and 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 central banks. So what what happens now is these reforms are consistent with the UN Charter. That UN Charter, ILO's Philadelphia Con uh, Declaration, even the IMF, uh, you know, I, Article of uh, Agreement. Four, which all emphasize maximum employment or full employment, and the, and 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 it is in, in it is consistent with commitment to the universal human rights. So it's a right-based approach uh, we have to take. Now the one final question, uh, 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 point I want to make here: so the, when government is, uh, borrows domestically and spends now, there can be some impact on balance of payments. Uh, we have to understand that because there will be a spending. There will be increase in income. There will be some imported, import needed. And that's why the foreign currency comes. A lot of this pandemic response 
are relief and, and package and, and a stimulus package, you, is, you need domestic money. You don't need foreign money. But it will have implications. It will have a spillover on foreign money. How do you solve? One of the ways, the, because as I say, the rest of the things that uh, my previous, the previous uh, speakers spoke are very, very time consuming. We cannot wait. Here comes the South-South cooperation. The swap arrangement between the Southern countries is, is going to be extremely important to develop swap arrangement, uh, bilateral arrangement of handling the, the, the balance of payment issues, the foreign currency issues, uh, until your SDR issues and all these things are sorted out. Thank you so, so very much, sorry, Professor Shodi. Thank you so very much. And I do apologize um, for having to cut you at this point. Um, we're just dealing with this on some issues of, of, of time. And my sincere apologies. Um, like I said before, we can always come back to you when we have the discussion. I'm very happy um, once we get through the speakers to allow you, um, you know, some more time at the end um, to, to complete your presentation and to make those points. I think what you have um, shared with us provides for an excellent segue to our next speaker, uh, Mr. Christopher Sinclair, who's the former Minister of Finance for Barbados, um, but now serving as an advisor um, for Barbados and other Caribbean countries on the issues um, of debt. Christopher? Thank you very much, Chantel, and uh, uh, allow me to express my appreciation to CPDC and the Organizing Facilitating Committee uh, for having me here this morning. It really has been a very rich um, uh, discourse so far, and uh, quite a few things that were said by uh, the professor just a while ago uh, bring, back, bring back a lot of memories for me uh, as I serve. But I'm here really uh, to speak to uh, the specific issues of, of, of debt and debt relief and international development finance reform uh, on behalf of CPDC and, and therefore I'm going to try as much as possible to stick to that and be as quick as possible because I think that um, as we go into the more interactive session uh, then uh, especially taking questions from the public uh, from the viewers uh, will be uh, a very important aspect of it. I'm not normally a very bold person, well, I don't make very bold statements but I think that given where we're at right now uh, given the presentation which particularly came from uh, the ambassador uh, of Pakistan uh, to the United Nations uh, at the beginning of this discourse. Um, I don't want to pour cold water on his optimism, but I think that we are at a very serious inflection point where the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals, the entire program of action, the 2030 Agenda, uh, which has been called for by the UN Secretary General, is now in serious peril uh, of, uh, of not being able to be achieved, not only in the time frame provided, but also in the manner in which it is happening. And it's not only because of COVID. Yes, we know COVID has caused tremendous devastation. In fact, it has exacerbated substantial vulnerabilities and structural weaknesses in economies across the developing world in the global south and especially in uh, small island developing states and I think uh, that I do have a responsibility as one of the few of one of the panelists here um, uh, specifically from a small island developing state and of course here in the Caribbean where uh, and in Barbados where this UNCTAD uh, 15 conference is, is scheduled to be held uh, next week and it is really that we have found ourselves at a crossroads uh, because of the levels of debt which we've had to incur, both as I say, post-COVID or due to COVID, but also pre-COVID. Uh, substantially, for the last 20, 25, 30 years, say a generation, certainly since the mid-1970s, that uh, small island developing states in particular have had to go on the international capital markets to raise very expensive, high value or high cost, low value debt, to finance development uh, within their own borders, within their countries, to invest in health and education and infrastructural development and social welfare and community development. And they have had to do this because, you know, in a funny way, many of us have been, quote unquote, graduated from accessing concessional financing. And because of that, we are unable to, we are not either recipients, we are not either eligible, uh, International Development Association eligible uh, to, to, to receive development financing from the World Bank. We hardly get access to uh, uh, concession, highly concession development financing, 
most of that goes to the LDCs, and practically it should because of their state and condition. But we're saying that because we've been cut out of that, we've had to find ourselves in private capital markets. In fact, mm -hmm. uh, a recent study done by, by, by Jubilee Campaign UK uh, indicates that uh, a substantial amount of the debt, which is owed by uh, SIDS in particular, up to close to 42% of that debt uh, has been uh, incurred on the international capital market and is due for payment to private creditors. Mm -hmm. um, some significant amount, of course, is owed to the multilateral development agencies, uh, particularly the World Bank, um, to less extent the uh, International Monetary Fund, and then, of course, the regional development banks, like CDB and so forth and so on. And th th the challenge with this uh, is that as you have to contain first with your structural limitations because of your small size, your remoteness, the small nature of your market. I heard professors speaking about borrowing domestically, but we have in SIDS very underdeveloped capital markets, which of course are not so capitalized as to allow us to raise the types of financing that we need. That's why we have to go external borrowing. Um, we also have limited markets where resources are not available by the private sector or through the private sector for investment in our economies. So we have to rely on capital inflows through FDI or again through borrowing. In the context of that, the cost associated with private borrowing is extremely high. And um, I mean, having myself sat in the position of Minister Finance, I know that, you know, I mean, when you go to market, particularly when you go with certain fundamentals as a small island developing state, um, high deficits on your balance of payments, um, constrained revenues in terms of your capacity to wear, export concentration, meaning that you have one or two uh, uh, economic sectors that can earn foreign exchange. Um, when you have these types of characteristics, which underlay the vulnerability of small states in particular, then almost immediately the risk premium for borrowing goes up. And once that happens, you have a choice. You can say, well, let's wait around to see if we're going to get some development assistance, which, of course, many uh, middle-income, small island developing states are not going to get in that type of way, and certainly not at the magnitude to uh, finance the type of investments in education, in health care, in infrastructure, in social welfare, and so forth and so on. Or you borrow. So you borrow to underwrite your development. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is when you are then confronted with other structural challenges relative to your inability, for example, to navigate the multilateral trading system to get your exports into markets. In fact, if you don't have the capacity to build, uh, the, the resources to build productive capacity, um, you can't even, if you get access to the markets, be able to satisfy uh, that access in relation to um, uh, uh, going after the demand that exists for your products. Because that, that too costs money to do. Mm -hmm. So your producers are having challenges. And then you end up in a situation where the risk premium increases because the lender says, I, I have to protect my. Uh, I have to protect my shareholders. I have to protect my investors, people who buy these bonds either on a syndicated basis or otherwise, and therefore, you 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 may have a challenge down the road. So let me increase the interest rate by a few percentage points, and a few percentage points can be absolutely devastating. If a situation arises like you bought up on a 2008 global financial meltdown or worse, you end up with a COVID pandemic. Mm -hmm. So that you go from substantial structural weaknesses that constrain your capacity to grow and to invest. You have to borrow to do quite a bit of that. And then you have these transient external shocks, what the economists yeah. call these exogenous shocks. I call them transient because we don't expect that, the, we didn't expect that the global financial thing would last forever. We know that will pan itself out, it leaves deep scars, deep financial scars, loss of uh, revenue, loss of businesses, loss of jobs, and you rarely ever recover from those. But it passes and it goes. But then almost on the button 10 years later, 
you brought up on a global pandemic of the nature of uh, the COVID-19 situation. And your entire economy now is placed under a significant amount of difficulty, even though you're still recovering from mm -hmm. the past uh, uh, periodic external shock. So that what then happens is that small island developing, and developing countries all over the world end up in a situation where you now have, as we have seen with COVID, to increase your level of, of debt. Again, Eurodad, one of our northern partners, has done a wonderful study and presentation to the United Nations in which they estimate, using World Bank statistics, that the average level of debt incurrence among developing countries, uh, particularly middle-income developing countries, will increase by 20 percentage points between 2020 and 2021. And we know that this is going to increase even further. In fact, they anticipate and estimate that on average for the next two years, external debt servicing shall increase by about $300 billion among developing countries. We know that of the 116 developing countries for which statistics are available, more than half, because about 60% of them are already running very high deficits pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. They now have to incur additional debt to not only protect against the pandemic, but also sustain their populations who are vulnerable already to existing debt, who are vulnerable already to high deficits, who are vulnerable to macroeconomic stability, now have to be put in another vortex uh, to ensure that those persons can keep their heads above water, farmers, women, small producers, the youth, and so forth and so on, uh, individual uh, entrepreneurs, small business people, just to survive the immediate shock of the pandemic or the global external uh, uh, disruption. So in the context of that, then you ask yourself, is the international multilateral global development community listening? We know they're hearing. We know that the research has been done by many people. It's been done by the World Bank, it's been done by the IMF, it's been done uh, by civil society organizations the world over. We know that they have the empirical data on their desk. We know that they're here in these types of forums, as we've presented here, and Ambassador um, did an excellent job of highlighting some of these issues. The question is, are they really listening to what is being said? Do we have to come to the crisis point where I started that there is the potential that many small island developing states and many other developing states are in danger of not meeting the SDGs, but further, if this gets worse, can actually lose ground that was gained under the UN MDGs. That, I think, presents a tremendous crisis that we have to guard against. And therefore, um, in the context of that, we believe that certain things need to be done. We first of all believe that the whole international financial development uh, finance uh, infrastructure needs to be reformed. I agree with the ambassador. I'm not going to repeat the things that he said, but we in CPDC and civil society in the Caribbean generally, we believe specifically that fundamental reforms have to come. And those reforms have to be reflected in what Professor just said, that we have to be not only at the table, our proposals have to be on the table. We have to be able to be present when countries are going to decide. Who decided? We know who decided. Who decided how far, how deep, and how substantial the DSSI was going to be? The industrialized countries, the G20, the G7, they came up with that. What level of consultation happened with developing countries as to what was required? Very little, if any. Who came up with, who determined the extent of, and the deeper nature of the common framework uh, uh, beyond the, 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 the DSSI? Again, the same set of circumstances. That is why what you end up with lacked ambition, because it only addressed a very small number of countries in a very small way, even the countries that it addressed, that those were done in only very limited ways. So that means that unless you put this thing within the context of a truly multilateral space like the United Nations, first, 
relative to a global summit on debt, debt relief, international development finance reform, international financial architectural reform, generally, unless you do that, then you are going to come up with these short of weak and very limited scope arrangements. Um, because they are already based on a fundamental belief that the market, the private market, must be prioritized over the developmental optics and the developmental objectives of those countries that need the relief the most. So that's the first thing. You have to democratize the process. The second thing is that the role which the UN plays in this has to become more fundamental. That's why this discussion in UNCTAD and the, the, the subsequent text that will come out for the agreement in terms of the Bridgetown communicate, that needs to have very strong language in it. That not only are these issues of debt, debt relief, debt reform, debt restructuring, international development finance reform, not only do these have to be positioned centrally in the text, in fact, it has to be a main part of that text, it has to come with action points. This is what we expect to achieve in the next two years, over the next year, over the next two years, over the next three years, until the next UN conference uh, on trade and development in the next four years. This is what we want to achieve. This is how we hope to achieve it. And these are the measures we expect that will happen. That, of course, will come in more detail as we go on. But broadly in the text, that needs to be said. A repositioning of the UNCTAD to carry out its original mandate of helping developing countries to interface, not only among themselves, South-South, but also between North-South and in the inter intergovernmental organizations uh, that, are, that, that, that have the responsibility for this, the IMF, the World Bank, and so forth and so on. It cannot be that it is an exclusive preserve of the IMF and the World Bank to determine, for example, debt sustainability analysis. And a debt sustainability analysis that is based on very narrow arithmetic methodologies that do not assess, that do not examine, that do not include developmental uh, imperatives that are important for people. How much must a country spend on education in order to get that level of production going? How much does it need to spend on healthcare to get that level of input and impact from its population? What type of infrastructural inputs does, does, will it need? In technology, for example, um, since technology is a big thing uh, post-COVID, you know, how, how, do you, how do you quantify the type of investments that are going to be required and ensure that when you are doing debt sustainability analysis, these things are factored in and costed so that we understand the need uh, for this. Uh, Ambassador spoke about the SD, SDRs. Mm -hmm. Absolutely critical. Again, very good move, fair enough, but it does not go far enough. There are countries, they are very rich and powerful countries who have been allocated <laughs> additional SDRs that they do not even need, mm. that they don't want. And we're saying, okay, if you don't want to give it to the developing countries, the SIDS, the least developed countries directly, give it to their development banks. Mm. Give it to their regional development banks and say, this resources, these resources are for these purposes. Therefore, climate crisis adaptation and mitigation. They are for infrastructural development. There are for specific poverty reduction programs. These are the things that we feel need to be done. And the ambition has to be greater because the situation demands it at present. So I think, um, you know, I'm not going to go much further than there. I think that for the time being, I'll rest there. But we in CPDC, we in civil society, believe that we are at a serious inflection point, as I said before. The crisis is now way beyond our capacity. And, uh, our Prime Minister here in Barbados, Prime Minister Motley, said only recently to a global forum uh, on this issue that there are three things that we really need. We need a global approach at a multilateral level. Mm -hmm. All countries must come together and work on this as a matter of urgency. We need to do it on serious moral grounds. That is that because it has to be done. There is not no a question of whether this is to be done or should be done has to be done because if we do not do it, we face cataclysmic failure of countries that many of whom 
particularly small in, uh, 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 SIDS in particular, who had passed certain stages and now face the uncanny situation of being graduated back to places that they would have passed and hopefully had conquered before. And then finally, we need to be strategic because we can't do everything. Mm -hmm. So therefore, we need to choose the things that we can do. And we know that debt relief, debt sustainability, development finance reform, international financial architecture reform can be done if we dedicate ourselves to this. But the fourth thing that we will need for that is leadership. And and that leadership has to come from, uh, from all ends, from civil society, right up, unions, private sector, and then, of course, fundamentally, the persons elected to serve us in the various halls of uh, development across the world. So that, that is our position. And I think that um, I'll rest there for the time being. But it is, a, it is a very interesting and urgent discussion, for sure. Thank you very much, Mr. St. Clair. And as you said, you know, we're already seeing a lot of the, the, the synergies in relation to the presentations um, that we've had um, that we've had before. And again, you know, good as you said, reflection points for us. This continual call to make sure that we have um, this focus on multilateralism. Yeah? Correct. Um, and you know, kind of debunking the fallacies that have been thought about the neoliberal approach that keeps on um, you know, being promoted as the way forward for developing countries that we're seeing now as being completely insufficient, and in particularly within this current context. Um, but I won't add any more there so that we can um, move swiftly on to our next um, presenter, which is Ms. Liddy Napfield. Mm -hmm. Liddy, you're on. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I'd just like to share my screen for a more guided presentation and also to make sure it's kept short. Um, like uh, the two other speakers, uh, Professor Chowdhury and Christopher, I'm going to focus on debt, although I work also closely with the Rege on tax justice issues. I think to address the question of debt for systemic reforms, there are three key questions uh, to ask or to address. One is how do we address existing huge outstanding debts and debt service? The second is how do we address lending and borrowing issues that have, you know, in large part led to this huge outstanding debts and debt service? And how do we address the root causes of the debt problem? Uh, addressing existing huge outstanding debts and debt payments of course the most immediate that we need is wider deeper debt cancellation and for that to be achieved uh, there has to be a redefining of what is a debt crisis and of course changing the very narrow debt sustainability frameworks that are being used to plan out debt cancellation and debt relief uh, responses um, we have already heard from Professor Chowdhury how very narrow these frameworks are, how very flawed these frameworks are. But I think the broader concept of debt crisis should also be interrogated because what is being used as a definition for debt crisis is very much creditor focused or from the vantage point of creditors. A debt crisis is there when uh, borrowers are unable to pay debts or unable to pay them on time and, and in enough uh, uh, payment due. And that is not how we should define debt crisis from the point of view of people and communities who are suffering the impacts of debt. We believe that a debt crisis is already there when debt payments have already resulted in government's inability to provide adequate and quality essential services and unable to uh, provide responses to extreme uh, suffering from, for instance, COVID-19 and other economic issues that our countries are already facing. We don't have to uh, you know, reach a point when we are unable to pay for the world to recognize that we are already very much burdened by debt distress. We would like to make these changes so that we can include all countries in need. Christopher has already made the point that there are very few countries covered by uh, current debt relief responses on the table. 
the inclusion of all debts, because for now only bilateral debts are being addressed, and all lenders and creditors. And a lot of uh, points have already been made about how the private creditors are not even uh, participating in a meaningful way in responding to the issue of debt. And we need to work for cancellation of outstanding debt, not just short-term cancellation of payments due, such as what the IMF did, or temporary suspension of payments, such as what the G20 has responded. And I think uh, both of our speakers, Christopher and Professor Chowdhury, has already underscored the tremendous importance of the establishment of transparent, democratic, and accountable global mechanisms to address unsustainable and may I add illegitimate debts and this must be under the UN system as they have already said and not lender or creditor dominated forums such as what we have had for decades. The second question about addressing lending and borrowing issues in fact there has been a response from UNCTAD on this when it created the Experts Committee on Responsible Finance, the results of which was presented in UNCTAD 13 in Qatar. And we would really like to see a similar initiative started again because we really need a review, a complete review and overhaul of lending and borrowing policies and practices that have been so detrimental to the countries of the South and our people and communities. First, there's an issue of creditor-driven and supply-driven lending or loan pushing, and many of this for projects that are actually harmful to peoples and communities of the South. I mentioned, for instance, the fact that it's already widely established and acknowledged that fossil fuels are a huge cause of climate change, but most of the loans for energy projects are still going to fossil fuels and not going to renewable energy. There is unfair and onerous terms in loan contracts, including high interest rates, cross defaults. You know, when you default on one uh, creditor, you're automatically considered defaulting on other loans. The tying up of public revenues to guarantee payments. For instance, uh, there are loan contracts when it's guaranteed that revenues from certain um, uh natural resource uh, income would be guaranteed to pay debt payments and then there's public guarantees to private liabilities to mention a few there's also the practice of the use of loans access to credit and debt relief schemes to impose policy conditionalities such as austerity measures tight fiscal and monetary policies which was which professor Chowdhury had already described and other neoliberal economic policies like privatization, deregulation, trade liberalization. There's also the policies and practices on risk assessments and credit ratings, which are to the detriment of borrowing countries. And on the part of Southern governments, the over-reliance on and, and indiscriminate borrowings and chasing access to credit alongside with prioritization of debt payments. I'd also like to now address the causes of the debt problem, uh, which systemic reforms must cover. The debt problem, uh, the, the systemic uh, responses should acknowledge the reality that there is net resource outflows from the south to the, to the north that create the conditions and justifications for heavy, heavy borrowings and pushing of loans. And of course, this puts a focus, a wider focus on the uh, systemic reforms necessary, not just those addressing the debt, such as, for instance, addressing the fact that production for the world markets rather than for domestic needs is what many Southern uh, governments are pursuing in their economic policies and programs. There is fixation with exports or orientation towards exports and plus competition for market access. There's the unfair and unjust trade relations, which leads to the race to the bottom in terms of prices of our commodities and low wages for our workers. 
There's the domination of our economies in the South by multinationals and foreign capital leading to huge profit re repatriation and plunder of our resources, including our natural resources. There is, which the Regia has covered, tax avoidance and evasion by multinational corporations, tax incentives and a race to the bottom in corporate taxation, and of course, illicit financial flows. And then we return back to the debt. A lot of the outflow of resources from the south to the north is through the debt service, including interest for payment. So these are just some of the really serious and grave issues we must address that result in this net resource outflows from our, from our countries to the north. It is not because we are unable to create wealth in our countries. It is because we are not able to retain this wealth that has led to the widespread poverty and the inadequacies of our government's ability or the undermining of our government's ability to respond to our needs. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Lydia, and, and, and for keeping your, your presentation just on time. Um, but again, for reinforcing the impact, as you were talking about, of having these resource outflows and therefore how it hampers the ability for developing countries in order to be able to address the critical issues um, that they need to, particularly within this context. Um, we go now to our very final presenter, um, last but not by no means least, um, and I'm going to now invite Ms. Manahatskin um, Yurantuka um, for the Center for Human Rights Development um, to present. Good morning and good afternoon. And before to go to my presentation, I want to apologize for my English language limitation, but anyway, I will uh, try to do my best. Okay, let me give a very quick uh, COVID situation summary in Mongolia. Total confirmed uh, 2, uh, 265,578 cases. Total death 1,073. And vaccinated first dose 69.1%, second dose 65.3%, and third dose uh, 277 point. 1,184 people. Actually, COVID-19 affected the entire spectrum of human rights from the right to life and adequate standard of living, social protection, work and employment, and education to protection from gender-based violence. It has exacerbated inequalities, poverty, food insecurity, discrimination, and other human rights with disproportionate impact on those most marginalized. The global crisis it's a, it, itself a human rights crisis. The COVID-19 has affected Mongolia in many ways. The spread of the virus exacerbated pre-existing issues such as overburdening the healthcare system and bringing poverty and hunger back on the rise. Government measures to address COVID-19 crisis forces immediate lockdown and travel mobilization restrictions. Second is social protection. The lockdowns and COVID-19 prevention measures are having an impact with far reaching consequences on the most fundamental freedoms of the people in Mongolia, including thousands of people who lost their jobs and income. Since the beginning of the pandemic, 68.9 thousand uh, jobs have been lost in Mongolia. According to the study made by scholars, 130,000 jobs will be lost in 2000, uh, 2021 unless we activate the economy. Moreover, children were affected by school closures and many have struggled with the realities of remote learning and without tools to do so, leads to increased unpaid care work for women. Domestic violence against women and children has risen significantly. On social protection, to deal with the economic fallout of COVID-19, the government of Mongolia took serious measures. For instance, like on March 2020, the State Emergency Commission started implementing a comprehensive set of fiscal measures to protect vulnerable households and businesses and uh, to support the economy with 5.1 trillion Mongolian turic. It's like uh, 1.79 uh, billion USD, equivalent to 13 0.7% of GDP in 2019. 
Also, the largest of these social benefits was the increase in the universal child allowance, which accounted for nearly 80% of the social protection part of the COVID-19 fiscal stimulus. For instance, child allowance increased from 20,000 to 100,000 uh, Mongolian to work per child. It's like from $7 to $35. Also, the government also increased monthly food stamps from 18,000 Mongolian to work per poor house hold to 36,000 Mongolian to Greek. Uh, government of Mongolia paying bills, electricity, heat, water, and waste bills of households, every household. And some enterprises for seven months with uh, Mongolian 650 billion funding from internet mining corporations. Specifically from the December uh, 1st, uh, 2020 until December 20th. Uh, one, the government of Mongolia will be responsible for the res electricity heat government of Mongolia. The economic costs, though, are very significant. Compared to the beginning of the year, the domestic currency, the Turk, depreciated against the US dollar economic policy, has loosened it significantly to maintain stability and protect the post vulnerable. According to the budget passed by the parliament, the overall fiscal balance is projected to reach 12.5% of GDP this year and 5.1% uh, in 2021. Moreover, Mongolia external debt reached 33 mil, uh, billion USD in June 2021, which is about 70% of GDP, over 90% uh, of which is de uh, denominated in foreign exchange. A report of the analysis of external debt uh, sustainability in Mongolia states that under the assumed pandemic, pandemic scenario, Mongolian external debt will increase by 30% from its steady state over the next 2028 20, quarters. Therefore, the country needs to pay greater attention to external debt sustainability for the next several years. Between 2020 and 2024, the government of Mongolia and other banks are scheduled to make payments for the bonds issued on international markets. It's also calculated a total of USD 14.5 billion of debt repayment will be made in the next four years. As a response to the pandemic, World Bank and the ADB gave a COVID-19 response fund in the forms of loans. These measures will uh, further push Mongolia's debt into the unsustainable territory due to the country's increasing burden of public external debt and more waves of austerity measures coming in. The other challenges also, some of the promising narrative for COVID-19 recovery in Mongolia heavily relied in how many, how mining sectors and other harmful industries bonds back started reopen and back in operation. Expert Experts have soared in recent months with the high level of coal deliveries to China. Gold production has increased dramatically with the opening of a new mine and high global prices. However, at what cost? Definitely debt is the structure of capitalist exploitation and capitalist domination today across the world. Cuts in public spending also lead to reductions in the availability of essential public services, which uh, interferes with the women enjoyment of their rights in several ways. First, women rely more, more than men on public services and social security guarantees. Second, women are left to fill the gaps in provisions that occur when, when services are reduced. Policy conditionalities that require governments to prioritize utilities of uh, services have similar consequences for women. For instance, the previous UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Health has commented on the increased inequality in access to health care, including greater out-of-pocket expenditure that results from privatization of health care services. Also, the privatization of dozens of public hospitals in the Philippines in line with the policy 
prescriptions of the Asian Development Bank and World Bank over the case has been linked by the government of the Philippines to the increasing maternal mortality rate. The UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Adequate Housing has also noted that privatization of housing services in the context of uh, financial crises further marginalizes poor women who are left without access to adequate housing. And uh, the recent report of the UN Working Group on Discrimination Against Women in Law and the practice depicts that women's rights are affected by the diversion of resources in debtor countries from social services and the, by the policy conditionalities frequently attached to international debt relief mechanisms. In conclusion, so debt is central question for both capitalism and patriarchy because they both rely on the undervalued work of women, whether in healthcare, education, or care services. We need substantive debt cancellation. Decisions around aid, debt, financing revenue and trade are not only decisions about revenue or growth. They are also decisions about the value of our shared commons. Local decision making for local resources about wealth distribution, gender equality, and about the obligation to ensure economic policies to advance uh, human rights and women's rights. They are also determine the ability of the state to address the right to development. Taxes and on harmful industries and practices like speculative financial transactions, military and arms trading, carbon emissions, and this extractive industries can provide financial means of implementation, support reductions in equality, and limit practices that undermine sustainable development. Transferring and redistributing wealth through taxation has the potential to tackle systemic discrimination based on gender, race, age, sexual orientation, disability, and socioeconomic status, while regressive taxes on goods and services failure to prevent tax avoidance and evasion, trade mispricing, and failure to regulate and tax corporations exacerbates inequalities and reduces state capacity for sustainable development investment. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, you know, that presentation really highlighted the quandary that developing countries find themselves with, particularly in this context. We're trying to address the needs of your population and societies in the context of a COVID pandemic, but then still then have to deal with how do you raise the sufficient capital and then having to go into capital markets and then being forced um, you know, into a situation, again, that reinforces um, the issues of the debt burden, um, on countries um, as well. And I think it is one, as in Mongolia, that certainly for the Caribbean, that we are all very too well um, aware of and faced with um, as well. I will not attempt um, to kind of go into any summary. Um, colleagues, I, I do apologize. We do have some sometime constraints to deal with, um, but I think that there have been some key emerging themes um, for us. Again, the return to multilateralism. Um, the need to make sure that we shore up UNCTAD's role um, in the discussion and in the debate um, as well. The acknowledgement that what we have now coming out of the AFIs are insufficient policies, insufficient um, processes in us in order to address the need for the key systemic reform uh, necessary to give developing countries um, and SIDS the needed fiscal space. Yeah, um, and the threat that it's happening, I think uh, Christopher and I, and I think um, the ambassador as well called the case urgent um, and, and critical now that we need to be able to have um, this need for systemic reform firmly addressed. But Ambassador Shaudi, I'm going to take the, take the first question, address the first question um, to you. And that question asks, has there been recommendations supported by empirical research on the best use of the fiscal deficit by developing countries to stimulate growth and sustainable development. Ambassador Chaudhry. I'm not sure if um, Ambassador Chaudhry is still with us or 
um, you know, if he is still there. Uh, yeah. Shantan, you are saying Ambassador Hashimi, not Chaudhary. Chaudhary oh. is me. I am sorry, uh, Professor Chaudhary, Professor Chaudhary. I meant you, Professor Chaudhary. My sincere apologies. So are you asking me or uh, the ambassador? I'm asking you, Professor Shaudi, and the question is, have there been recommendations supported by empirical research on the best use of, physical, of the fiscal deficit by developing countries to stimulate growth and sustainable development? And I'll also as well come to Ambassador um, Hashmi afterwards as well. Yeah, yeah there are plenty of, plenty of examples where, I, I remember what I was trying to say here, my emphasis is on the ability of the government to borrow from its own central bank. So my one is not we referring to the plea, you know, the, quite often when we have discussions about uh, uh, debt, we, it gets entangled with the external debt. External is important. I'm not uh, discounting. But central bank historically play a developmental role, even in the U.S., in the early stages of US, when the government had to borrow, they borrowed from their own central bank. And as, as the, the Honorable uh, five, the finance minister, former finance minister Barbados said, that, uh, that, that your domestic, uh, the, for the majority of the developing countries, domestic capital market is thin. You cannot borrow from your domestic capital market, but you have the ability to borrow from your central bank. And that has been the case historically for many, many developing countries, because otherwise, how did they build all this infrastructure and their, their system is only through the borrowing from the central bank. That stopped, that kind of thing stopped when all sorts of factors were put there from the, from the 80s, like central bank independence and the debt ceilings and so on and so forth. And, and, and this, this, as I said, have got no empirical or theoretical basis for those arbitrary uh, ceilings. Of course, there, has been, there are examples of abuse. Uh, they, many governments have abused their, this ability to, to, to uh, borrow, but you do not throw the baby with the bathwater. If the governments were abusing, that's why the role of the, center, the CSOs, the civil society organizations is very important to have a, you know, a democratic oversight of what the governments are doing, what the central bank is doing. So that is the, the, the reform that I have suggested, the domestic reform of the, 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 the fiscal space that it can create. There are plenty, plenty of examples I, I can give the, of the of this cent, central bank's historical role. I, I gave one example, in, say, say, say Bangladesh, I originally come from Bangladesh, government is constantly borrowing from the central bank. And, uh, and, uh, and that's how the government's big projects are happening in, in Bangladesh now. And in the, in the, in the, in the, in the pandemic era, uh, Indonesia has, uh, has suspended their legislation. Philippines has suspended that legislation that, that prevents uh, government from borrowing uh, from the central bank. Even the European uh, Central Bank is, is lending indirectly to the government uh, uh, through uh, mechanism, which I'm not, you know, for the time, uh, the sake of time, I'm not going to be too detailed. So there, you know, yeah, I'll stop here. Yeah. Thank, you for, thank you for that, um, Professor Shaudi. And I wanted to also um, invite Mr. Christopher Sinclair as well um, to, to comment on this question. Yeah, I, I think the question is a very good question, and it's one that, for cer certainly for developing countries, uh, is critical because um, uh, deficit financing for development purposes has always been a part of uh, the toolbox of governments and ministries of finance. Um, the question is what level of deficit is sustainable and uh, uh, where you can go. It's not, you, you can't have deficit, even though in the recent like well, in the in the in the neoliberal language uh, and the neoliberal mantras you are to have a balanced budget and preferably to have a primary surplus or to have overall budget surplus uh, in developing countries where things have to be done where schools have to be built where roads have to be done where uh, 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 health care has to be provided that is not always that is a luxury in literature mm -hmm. it is not always practical to do that 
Um, the, the other point on that, as the professor was making, in relation to central banks, is central banks' purpose is to maintain uh, monetary stability in a country. That's, that's, that's the principal role. It's not to be a lender to government per se. Mm -hmm. It is to maintain monetary stability so that your exchange rate, so that your reserves, so that your interest rates are uh, modulated and not uh, going to extremes, up and down uh, in extremes. Because the more predictability, the more stability, the better it is for investors, yeah? both domestic and uh, external investors. In the context of that, then, a central bank working with its government has to determine what factors are present within a context, within a particular period of time that may affect that stability. And therefore, um, central banks from time to time have been called on to uh, uh, finance government's budgets. The, of course, that has implications, as the professor has said, because it has implications for balance of payments. We saw that in Barbados. I had that challenge in particular. It has implications. It can go and have implications for exchange rate in terms of whether you have a fixed exchange rate or, or whatever the case may be, a regime or whatever the case may be. But I don't think we can artificially say, as the professor has said, along the neoliberal spectrum of, uh, of, of, of economics and econometrical modeling that a central bank must just be as the, the current thing has gone, be totally out of the picture and that it should not uh, lend to government because that, I think, poses a, a significant challenge because then what happens is that if the other parts of the system are not as liquid or as not as permissive or as not as accessible as need, to, as need be, in the context of what has to be done, particularly if you have an external shock like a pandemic, then the country has to go borrow externally. Mm -hmm. And when you borrow externally, you get back to the same challenges that we've been discussing here. Mm -hmm. and, and we've seen this mm -hmm. in real life since 2020, since March 2020, for many developing countries. So it's a balance. It really is a balance that has to occur. Um, you know, too far left is right. Too far east is west, as they say. So the issue is striking the appropriate balance and not having to have hard set positions on, on, on each particular aspect of how your economic, economic and financial policies uh, will evolve and be implemented. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. Um, I want to also invite Lady to come in um, on this debate and this question. Christopher talking about, you know, being able to strike that balance um, and to, to, to speak to and just have some engagement around, you know, how well developing countries are going to be able to strike that balance that is going to be necessary. Lady? I, it is very difficult to strike that balance, and I think the points have been very well made. Uh, my concern really is the balance between responding in an immediate way for immediate needs and responding so that you can pursue longer term structural changes. Um, I think there should be also a debt cancellation so that there is funds also not for just for immediate needs but also for the financing and space for those longer term structural changes that need to be that need to be pursued so that is the balance i think that's very important to keep note of um i have not been in government but i can imagine uh, as Christopher has, and I can imagine how very difficult those kinds of decisions are made. Uh, but that's why we need international solidarity and cooperation across nations, especially considering that the situation that most southern governments and countries are in are due to uh, actions, policies that are beyond our control, that are due to actions and policies of those that are economically powerful globally. And that's why we need these kinds of forums where we can discuss what together we can do as an international community to address uh, not just the changes to the global system, but also uh, how we enable Southern governments and Southern countries to pursue the changes that are needed in our economies. And, and I know that's quite a, a huge dilemma because those who are economically powerful are, are largely responsible for what the situation we are in, but also refuse to give up that power. 
uh, also refuse to pursue the changes that might, uh, how do you say, that will actually threaten some of the their economic interests in, in this global order that we are in. So that's, uh, that's a really difficult spot we're in and that's why we need uh, people from below to engage in that change because they're not gonna do that willingly so that we really need to create huge public pressure in order for us to be able to compel not just our own governments in the South, but also the governments and powerful international financial institutions that they, that they dominate and that they control uh, in order to force them to act towards systemic reforms and changes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent point, Lydia. And I, and I think that was also reinforced in, in some of the discussions that we've had. Um, I think one of the panelists used that term that we really need to kind of democratize this space, right? Um, and, 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 you know, the need for civil society um, to be able to organize internationally um, to lend the necessary pressure. And in that context, I wanted to then also go to the, the speaker from Mongolia. I'm going to try not to do any further damage to your name again, and my apologies. Um, but I remember your presentation, you know, really speaking to um, the system and framing it within that patriarchal framework that really undervalues the contribution of, of, of women. Um, and others in society and to speak to how we can encourage these movements that are necessary among civil society among vulnerable groups to order to be able to support this call um, for systemic for systemic reform and to ensure that our governments have the necessary fiscal space i think uh, we call on untagged member states to include concrete recommendations to measure and implement gender equality and women's rights mechanisms with respect to trade policy in the final draft such uh, measures can only be successful if they ensure the participants of women's led constituencies among the broad group of stakeholders in negotiations of trade policy and agreements and thus also in the untagged conferences Second, measures in trade policy include taking a gender mainstreaming perspective whereby all trading arrangements under negotiations are viewed with a gender lens, assessing positive and negative impacts. Trade policy should be transformative to ensure social and gender justice and protection of the environment. UNCTAD is able to function from a broad mandate in which the international debt and tax structures discussed in connection with the trade policy re reflections. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Dr. Derecha, I wanted to address this question to you. Um, one of the questions coming from Slido from one of the participants and it asks, what's the possibility of developing countries implementing tax reforms to lessen the negative impact of the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, thank you. I think uh, there, there are there are very limited possibilities at the at the country level for two reasons. One, uh, you know, in a globalized economy, uh, countries are not uh, able to control movement of resources within their own boundaries. Uh, just to give you one example. Uh, most of transactions today happen between the same capital groups, 60% according to OECD estimate. They are, these transactions are the, me, the mechanisms through which profits are shifted from one, con, uh, from one country and, and profits are stashed in low or zero tax jurisdictions. What does it mean in clear terms? It means any developing country is not a position as, as long as this, this such transactions are allowed and as long as they facilitate profit shifting to tax the, all the profits generated in their economies. It needs an international cooperation. It needs information exchange. It needs respecting taxing rights. Uh, for example, if, if taxes are unpaid in Kenya, the Kenyan government should be supported to chase the profits slash generated in its own country and slash somewhere to be able to tax it also uh, 
to be to be supported to be taxed to be to have a share on the global profit of multinationals so the structures are so interconnected the autonomy revenue authorities can have to to tax all profits generated in their in their economies are uh, very limited however it does not mean that uh, the developing country governments should just uh, uh, blame the inter international structure for not doing in enough. There are a lot of tax giveaways they are doing themselves in form of concessions to multinationals which they can't stop. There are, there, in many countries, wealth is not tax, taxed. Uh, property tax is not introduced. There are a lot of domestic measures to be taken. But just to conclude, and it might not be directly related to this question, uh, when we call uh, for the solidarity with ANCTA, when we call for uh, fight back against uh, the, the efforts to, 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 limit the, to, to limit or to narrow the scope of ANCTA's engagement, we know there are a lot of countries which are against this. Uh, in individual statements, many developing countries are supportive of a UN uh, tax, uh, a UN tax body that are supportive of many measures. But what happens to them when they are in, 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 in some processes outside the UN system? Why don't they bring up this as, a, as an issue and, and bring, bring this in the structures they are involved in? And always challenge the structures which are parallel and which are undermining the role of the United, the, the, the United Nations. So what I'm saying is, what we as civil society should try to do is to reintroduce, reintroduce really this developing country solidarity so that they don't go into things as individual countries, so to speak, to restore the, the, the spirit of bad bandu, to bring back solidarity of developing countries so that they can, because individual countries are exposed, especially in, in, in times of debt crisis, as you know, they negotiate debt, rescheduling the debt uh, payment and everything as individuals, as individual countries. So they are exposed to, to pressure. Their only strengths can come through, through collaboration. So uh, we have to look at this from a G77 uh, perspective, only a united developing countries on international arena can help us also mitigate the negative impacts coming onto our countries from the external. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, I want to come to uh, Mr. Sinclair, and I'm going to apologize for putting him on the spot here because um, I'm going to lean um, Christopher on yes, your your current role in terms of you know, speaking on behalf of civil society within this context, but also as well in your, your, your former role as Minister of Finance. And I thought there were two challenges that came out from what Dr. Duretje said. Um, he talked about, you know, how can we resuscitate developing um, country, you know, coordination and speaking as one voice in order to be able um, to address these issues. So one of the questions is, again, how can civil society support that? Mm -hmm. But then as well, from a governmental perspective, what is it that stops developing countries from very frontally addressing um, some of these um, these issues and challenges. Huh? Um, because I think, as Dr. Duarte was saying, we, we know them. Huh? We even agree on them. So what is it that is stopping us within the multilateral space from acting together um, in order to be able to, um, you know, speak coherently and also as well, you know, kind of mount um, you know, a very kind of coherent resistance to that. And then the second thing as well that Dr. Rachel talked about is the fact that within developing countries themselves, we have measures and we do have some level of fiscal space, although we are constrained and we recognize that constraint, but there are things that we are not doing and perhaps are choosing not to do. And, you know, perhaps help us to understand that context um, of, of some of the, the challenges and things that prevent developing countries um, from also using the fiscal space that may be available, available particularly um, internally. I, I, I'll take, I'll take, I'll take um, a fairly quick response to what you've said and the questions you've asked. And they're very important. I listened to um, our colleague from the tax uh, justice organization. I think, Chantel, there, there is... There are some very subtle, well, perhaps I shouldn't say subtle, they are a little bit more than subtle asymmetries between the positions of developing countries 
as it relates especially on this subject of uh, uh, global tax governance. And um, because of the way in which we have developed, as you know, um, a lot of s smaller islands have used uh, offshore tax jurisdiction planning as a way to diversify their economic structures, um, away from the traditional agriculture and, of course, from the over-concentration on tourism. Um, these have been very unfairly and liberally defined as tax havens, places where people uh, allow ex, uh, illicit flows to go and, and so forth and so on. Never mind the fact that some of the biggest tax planning jurisdictions in the world are not in developing countries. They're actually in developed and industrialized countries. But that's a, different, that's a point for a different, a, a, a different occasion. Our challenge though now, both as government and as civil society in in, 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 in small island developing states and in, in those places where we have tax jurisdiction planning, is that this thing seems to be going away from the original mandate of trying to create, through the OECD working group, um, a set of global and multilateral standards by which everybody will follow. You know, we began at a stage where it was unilaterally done. Barbados fought a very good case in the Caribbean. We got to the table, they established a working group. Uh, uh, to work on these issues. Of course, we had 9-11 and the financing of terrorism and money laundering and the whole gamut of issues. And it has been evolving. But what has happened, as the doctor, has, good doctor has said, is that there have been parallel ex um, uh, cases now uh, and, and situations where groups like the, like the EU and others have been trying to establish standards that sometimes even go beyond mm -hmm. what the general OECD working group on tax, uh, t harmful tax practices has been doing. Now, we've seen now with the Biden initiative, because that's where it began, you know, people are saying, no, this is global tax initiative, but let's put it where it began. It began with uh, President Biden. It was one of his core uh, uh, campaign promises, which he has now been able to get the G7 to endorse with specific car votes for, for London and so forth and so on in terms of their financial sectors. And most countries have gone on to it. Where we have a slight divide sometimes is, as you know, Chantel, a good uh, student of political science, you, you, know, you know all do well, that there are two things that distinguish a sovereign country. One, the capacity to determine its foreign policy, and two, the capacity to determine its internal tax policy. And if you take that away from a country, then you know what else is there left to categorize or classify this country as independent? That somebody else will tell you your tax rate should be X or Y. It's not, whether, it's not important whether it is 15, 0, 5, or 25. The fact of the matter is that you, for your internal planning purposes, you for your internal fiscal requirements must be able to at least determine what your rates should be, rather than having somebody else impose a rate and say that you must follow that rate. Because you're saying, I am going to tell you what structure you must have, and now I'm going to tell you what rates you should have. Therefore, it leaves nothing for me to do. <laughs> I am just a taker of, of, of instruction. So that is fundamentally important, and because the developed countries, the industrialized countries, have pushed that wedge between developing countries. It is why you're not getting that unison uh, in terms of that collectivity, in terms of us putting forward the thing, uh, because they're saying, oh, but you know, um, the countries in Africa, you, you, the, the problem is that the, there's these companies who um, are coming from Canada and elsewhere, and they're domiciling in Barbados as, as kind of shell companies. They're not doing any production there. There's no, there's no um, serious thing going on there. Um, but what they're doing is shifting the profits uh, you know, the mm -hmm. issue, uh, base erosion and profit shifting. And what they're doing is, is, is taken away, even though they're doing the manufacturing in your country, they're not giving you the opportunity to get the tax benefit from it, but they're passing it into a country like Barbados. But you, when you really look at it, the amount that we actually make from that type of yeah, setup yeah. is extremely small. Mm -hmm. the, the benefit really goes back to uh, the countries where, or, or the protectorates, of industrialized countries, the Guernseys, the Isle of Mans, and so forth and so on, where a large amount of that money is kept. So we have to find a common ground. 
Mm -hmm. And I believe that that is why one of the proposals that we've made at CPDC and that we continue to make in civil society generally is that there must be a global South-South dialogue on mm -hmm. financial framing, financial planning, financial investments. Mm -hmm. Because there is a way among ourselves where we can present a collective view that covers all of the mm -hmm. asymmetrical differences that we naturally will have because we're operating in slightly different spaces even if our overall case yeah. is the same so i think that that is that is um that is that that that, that is where we're at with that but um and it's something that we really need to pay very close attention to of course you're not going to see a lot of it in in, in the text coming out of UNCTAD because people are the developed countries frankly do not want developing countries to have a common position and platform on this. It serves their purpose to keep that wedge between us. And that, that points into the important role of civil society then Precisely. in the back, then being able then to work together to be able to bridge Correct. those divides um, that is there. Um, so again, you know, kind of the important role of civil mm -hmm. society. We have a, another question um, and it, is, it asks, is there any innovative finance that climate vulnerable nations can tap into um, to build resilience. Um, Professor Shardy, you know, if you want to um, take a stab at this question, is there any innovative finance that climate vulnerable nations can tap into to build resilience? Yeah, there are uh, plenty of uh, innovative way of uh, doing business uh, taxing. One is actually, uh, you know, you, what we call uh, so-called syntax. You know, there are things like tobaccos and all these, you know, they are, uh, the alcohol, which are also good for the public health, though you can uh, tap on that. Uh, but as I said, for the developing countries, taxation is important, but there is a limit up to which you can raise the tax in the developing countries. There are people are talking about financial transaction tax. How much financial transition happens uh, in, 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 in average developing countries? Yes, there are a lot of financial transition happening in emerging economies. There are only few, but large number of countries. No, no, uh, you don't have that much of financial transactions. In the small island countries, which Honor um, Christopher uh, Chris was uh, talking about, uh, they are the so-called tax havens and things like that. And he's correct. He said, no, it is, there's not a lot of money that goes there. So it's, it, 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 the, what I'm trying to say, you have options of innovative finance, but at the end of the day, that will not raise the amount of money that you, you need. Because you know, the, 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 most of the developing countries, your informal sector is about 70%. It's small business, it's small, you no know, district street hawkers, uh, the rickshaw pullers, how much tax you can collect from them, how, you know, from these people? And then what you have, those countries which have got minerals, there you have some opportunity to design your tax, how to capture you know, the, the rent from the, the mineral sectors. Again, you don't have very many countries with that opportunity. So this is why I have been emphasizing that for the majority of the part of the, your expenses, you have to create an, a, a system where you, by central banks, have to play a developmental role. With all respect, yes, central banks, even in the US, if you look at the reserve banks, uh, the, the Federal Reserve's uh, mandate, it has got dual mandate. It cannot ignore the employment mandate. And in the, if you look at the IMFs, Article 4, uh, uh, the, the preamble, it says, Economic policies, you no, know, the, so the aim of the economic policy should be orderly economic growth. So growth comes first, even the IMF. Orderly economic growth with reasonable price stability. It doesn't say you have to have a target with a reasonable price stability, given the taking into account the specific circumstances of that country. So there's a, you know, if you take that that literally. And you have a lot, you can create a lot of flexibility. How do you define reasonable price stability? And again, I emphasize, as, as uh, my Chris mentioned, the South South cooperation becomes uh, uh, vital uh, uh, in this context. Without the Southern solidarity, I remember during the Addis Ababa, uh, the, uh, the uh, impasse, the 
African countries, they, they created a wedge between other countries and African countries by saying that they will send uh, uh, barefoot doctors kind of thing. They will send you the tax um, advisors. Uh, they will provide you technical assistance, some tax advisors who can help you uh, uh, to, to track all this money, where it's going and things like that. So that will be provided free by uh, OECD as a, as a technical assistance. And, and that create, you know, created a wage between the, the, the African countries. They thought, okay, we'll get those the tax accountants and tax advisors, that will help us. We don't need a, a, the solidarity with the rest of the developing countries. This divide and rule policy is, is actually killing the southern countries. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for that. We have one last question. We really are coming to the end of our, um, of our time from the, for the representative from Mongolia. Um, and this question asks, can you give us an example of a human rights approach to debt relief? Can you give us an example of a human rights approach? What does a human rights approach look like in relation to debt relief? Human rights approach, we have to be... Uh, we have to be... Um, let's see. Uh, open uh, transparency and uh, in English. Mm -hmm. hi, hi. Hi, sorry, I'm not sure if you're are, are you hearing the, the, the question or I think you were saying in, in the context of a human rights approach. So um, you talk about transparency, being open, one that kind of breaks down that paternalistic um, framework and really values, um, you know, women's rights and women's and, and women's work. I don't know if you would agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you so very much, um, colleagues. We've come to the end of our time, um, and I want to just give each of the panelists just half a minute <laughs> really just to kind of wrap up and say any last words because i know that we've you know we've had a full morning and there's such rich richness in the discussion you would really think that this is a discussion that perhaps we can continue to have um but again time is against us so just your final words um before we close off this session and i know that the ambassador is no longer um, with us, but we just want to thank him for his very, very insightful comments at the very beginning um, of our session, very on point, um, and the areas that he identified specifically that civil society um, can join the fight um, and ensure that we can have, you know, this, this the whole motion of this systemic reform um, actually um, move forward very practically. So I'm going to invite um, now, if I can, please ask, um, Christopher, Mr. Christopher Sinclair, to, to lead off. Thank you very much, Am Chantel. I, I think we had an extremely uh, powerful and deep discussion today. Uh, clearly, uh, the issues are, are, are very, very, very important and upfront. I think we need to keep it there. Civil society needs to continue to press uh, because uh, the responses we are getting are not as satisfactory as, as, we, uh, as they ought to be in the circumstances uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic. The issue of debt continues to be a major issue. It has always been a big structural issue, but I think now it has become acute. And as our countries pile on even more debt to deal with this particular crisis, which has not been of their making, perhaps of nobody's making, but um, as we continue to pile on that debt, the question is how do we service these debts without having the type of relief that is going to be necessary to give us the fiscal space to do the things that we need to do to achieve the sustainable development goals? Right now, it does not look good. And therefore, uh, we are calling from CPDC on the international community, the multilateral system, and certainly on all of our civil society partners to put all of our effort into ensuring that we get a better deal on that for developing countries. Thank you very much. Liddy, your last, your final comments? Yeah, well, i just like to reiterate the message that it's really crucial that we 
uh, mobilize a civil society in order to generate the political will needed. I don't think it's the lack of clear solutions or well-evidenced arguments for the solutions. Uh, it's really the lack of political will at this point. And so we must need to generate that by mobilizing a civil society. And at our current uh, strength is not enough. So we need to reach out, we need to broaden, we need to work closely with each other. Okay, thank you. Dr. Director, your final comments? Um, in, in addition to strengthening the, the mobilization capacity of the civil society, what I would like to add is, it is not only the, the, the mandate of answered which is at stake it's 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 what's at stake is uh, a forum a platform an institution in which the, in the interests of developing countries are articulated and put forward the whole effort of the whole effort of uh, destroying or weakening such institutions has to do with perpetuating the domination which is which is keeping us behind so I think my my call is really for a collaboration and a joint mobilization of the G77 and civil society to defend uh, the mandate of UNCTAD and to defend also the United Nations as, the, as an institution for a universal uh, uh, process of transparent and democratic process of addressing international issues. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Shauri? Yeah, I actually wholeheartedly agree with what uh, Dr. Reje has said, because the erosion of the United Nations mandate, uh, I'm really alarmed when I see United Nations having a memorandum of understanding with World Economic Forum, which has got no legitimacy, and that, that uh, memorandum of understanding is not done transparently, and still we don't know what is in there. And now United Nations in partnership with the World Economic Forum is having a food start meet, ignoring its own organizations uh, like FAO and World Food Program. This is an extremely dangerous trend where these the, 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 the uh, multinational corporations are, have, and are capturing the, the agenda. And now they have floated an idea called inclusive inequality. They initially talked about rising inequality and they have the problem with inequality. Now they have redefined inequality as inclusive inequality, meaning that this inequality also lifted a lot of people out of poverty. And so we don't have to worry too much. And that we have seen even during the pandemic, how much the wealth of the, the, the super rich has increased uh, even during the pandemic. Yeah, they have they have the audacity and ob, uh, obnoxious uh, taste of going to this space while on the earth people are dying. I don't mind they have, they want to go to this space. Leave your money here. So the issue is they they want to undermine Ankta. They want to undermine uh, the, the the inclusive forum because that will be easier for them to make money. So I I wholeheartedly uh, agree with uh, Dr. Derese that we really have to work hard to strengthen the mandate of the United Nations, ECOSOC, as well as the ECOSOC is the forum where the global economic governance issues should be discussed, not at the World Economic Forum. Yes, yeah, thank you. And, 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 and UNCTAD is a vital organ uh, in the United Nations that looks after the interests of the developing countries. Thank you. Um, and then again, um, final words from Manahatskin. I think we all, you know, need to work together to raise our voices from the ground and build, you know, international solidarity. And that is really important for us also. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and let me say before I hand over to Mr. Stefan Prato from the International Facilitation Committee to give the closing remarks to thank all of you, um, the panelists, for what has been an extremely um, engaging discussion. Um, again, I, you know, I repeat, it's, it's often really hard to get the fullness of this discussion within the time constraints that we have. 
but I thought that everybody did a really good job um, at highlighting some critical issues, and I'm hoping that we have other opportunities to continue to this um, discussion and debate um, as well in relation to um, looking at systemic reforms for our fiscal space. I also want to thank very much the UNCTAD Secretariat, both in Geneva and in Barbados, um, for facilitating this um, this plenary, um, and also, of course, to the Caribbean Policy Development Center as well, who've worked along with the International Facilitation um, Committee. Stefano, over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Chantal. And again, thanks to all the, uh, those that have contributed to this excellent session. Let me just uh, uh, not inflict uh, any longer uh, intervention to the participants, but just uh, try to expose three main takeaway of the discussion, particularly focusing on the role of UNCTAD. So first of all, I think it's essential, and I think the session has uh, reaffirmed that there is a critical role for UNCTAD in terms of its independent and systemic research and analysis. Uh, COVID exposed the unbearable restrictions, restrictions on fiscal space uh, on developing countries. And rather than addressing issues of tax or debt or development cooperation, capital flows in fragmented technical discussions, very often in isolation one from the other, it is really essential to assess their systemic interconnections in the context of the current division of labor within the global economy, where we realize increasingly that inequalities, commodity, debt traps are all the consequences of fundamental imbalances in the way in which the global economy is organized and cannot really be addressed in isolation from the rectification of economic trade, investment and technology regimes that very often relegate developing countries to the lower end of global economic system. So, in this is essential to reaffirm the centrality of the role of UNCTAD in assessing, analyzing, exposing the shortcomings of the current pattern of globalization from a developmental perspective and from a viewpoint of developing countries and their tra structural transformational challenges. This clearly requires a systemic perspective, one that should not only integrate the very many economic domains in, an, in a theory of structural transformation, but also be enriched uh, by a strong climate and ecological angle, but also a very strong feminist uh, analysis. Uh, recognizing the fundamental and huge subsidy to the global economy that the persistence of the sexual division of labor continues to persist. So it's essential to look at UNCTAD uh, as a critical space for systemic research and analysis, uh, and we need to preserve its capacity to really range wide in the systemic interconnections and in its independence. Secondly, uh, beyond analysis, uh, it's essential to recognize the fundamental role that UNCTAD has as a normative space to really advance systemic reforms. UNCTAD is a space where to advance clear policy propositions for systemic reforms can ex expand the fiscal space in manners that do not further increase the subjugation of developing countries and rather restore and strengthen their serenity over their development pathways. And many of these issues really require uh, fundamental governance reforms rather than technical solutions. Political solutions that can tackle the current power and imbalances, reform current institutions, and create new ones under the democratic auspices of the United Nations. And this calls for a strengthened role of the Trade and Development Board, the UNCTAD commissions, the reaffirmation of the role of the intergovernmental group of experts in FFD, and also a stronger role of UNCTAD in the FFD process. Lastly, and beyond this analytical and normative role of UNCTAD, let's also recognize the geopolitical importance of UNCTAD. UNCTAD plays a, a critical role in the struggle to shift the very center of economic governance away from developed countries dominated institutions and clubs uh, towards a truly inclusive multilateralism where developing countries have full say and equal voice. Once again, exactly as it was in, the, in 1945, the United Nations are called to advance a decolonization agenda. This time, the decolonization of the global economy and the new path to sovereignty and freedom for developing countries. Well, UNCTAD as an institution, as a space, 
is on the edge of this struggle, pretty much being both the leading frontier as well as the last defense line. The civil society we therefore strenuously defend its role and reaffirm its mandate. And I hope this has come across quite strongly, not only in this session, but also in the previous one. And with this, I think I'd like to thank you all. Welcome to tomorrow's program. Uh, at 8.45 Barbados time, we will have uh, a small official closing remarks of the forum. And this will be followed by four very powerful um, side events sessions uh, uh, organized respectively by the Asia Pacific Forum on Women, Law and Development, uh, uh, TAC Justice Network Africa, the Global Policy Forum, together with Jubilee US Network, uh, Euridad, and the Justice Network Norway, and then Friends of the Earth International. And this will happen in the 9.05 to 10.20, and then sub subsequently in the 10.25, 11.40 time slot. So thanks again for this interesting and exciting discussion. Please watch out for what comes next, particularly because out of these two days, we need to start drafting a powerful civil society declaration that will go actually into UNCTAD 50. And please uh, join again for tomorrow's uh, plenary as well side event session. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>